Well, good morning and welcome to the Sports Wales National Centre for day three of the Quad Nations wheelchair rugby coverage here on Channel 4. We are very excited because this is the business end of the competition. It's semi-final and final day with four great nations of the game, GB, USA, France and Japan doing battle. And I've got alongside me Paralympic gold medal winner with GB from back in Tokyo. We've got Jim Roberts here. Jim, you've, you've been here, you've been enjoying the competition so far. But really, you know, this is where it's all done. This is when it matters the most. Yeah, absolutely. As you said, this is fully the business end of the tournament now. The teams will be looking to make make their mark on this tournament now and and put a marker down to go forward to Paris. Look, USA, they've come here top ranked in the world. GB, reigning Olympic champions. We've got pedigree with Japan, France, the European champions. Who out of these four have impressed you the most? What have you made of the way that the competition has unfolded to this point? Well, so GB and France obviously were doing really well until yesterday. So GB is still the only unbeaten team at the moment. Um, so they'll be looking to build on that. Japan really impressed me yesterday. They looked really smooth, really consistent. Um, and then, well, yeah, so we'll, we'll just see how GB get on today. Hopefully a big win for them. <laughs> Hopefully a big win for GB. Well, look, they got a nice win at the back end of day two's action. We're going to recap that now for you as they went toe-to-toe -to -toe with France here at the Sport Wales National Centre. <laughs> So there we have it, victory for GB late last night against France. And seems a, as good a side as any to start speaking about with you, Jim. What do you make of GB? Where, where are they at in terms of what is an enormous year? Paralympics in, in France coming up. You're later. right, it's a huge year coming up with the, the Paralympics. It's what all of these teams really aspire to win and, and work towards. So they'll be just final, final tuning now, polishing up some lines. I think we saw a couple of them last night. I don't think they showed everything, but really encouraging to see what they were working on. Well, well, let's take a look at the squad here. And without embarrassing you too much, Jim, there was a rather large gym-shaped hole to fill after that gold medal in Tokyo. Who out of that squad are impressing you and who are needing to step up today? Sport moves on pretty quickly, and I, don't, <laughs> I, th I think they filled that v very, <laughs> very fast. Um, Stuart is, is playing out of his skin at the moment. He looks phenomenal. Uh, a player I mentioned yesterday was Kieran Flynn. He's he's really stepped up as a newbie to the international scene. Um, and Gavin Walker as the captain is is just an absolute stalwart. He's unflappable and and looked really consistent yesterday. Well, well, uh, there, let's take a closer look at that GB team. octane vt from the gb boys but let's talk about who they're playing here in this semi-final old foes usa the team that you defeated in tokyo in that paralympic final yeah i mean usa are coming in ranked number one in the world as as is probably right they've got phenomenal stacks deep players all across the board so really exciting to see what they bring today 
I know that you were speaking to their coach, Joe Delagrave, about their prospects today. And, and this is the squad, and undeniably, the name that jumps out is number five, Chuck Aoki. Yeah, Chuck Aoki burst onto the steam 2010 in the World Championships, and he has been one of the best players consistently for over a decade now. He is, he is that good and that important to USA. But missing on the first day, I think he was under the weather and then maybe a bit of a flatter performance yesterday. So we're imagining that he's going to come out all guns blazing here in this semi-final. I'm expecting USA to come out, as you mentioned, all guns blazing and really look to make a stamp on this tournament now. We are getting into the knockout stages. Well... Chuck Aoki, the man, but there's plenty of other talent seeming through this USA side. There they are, the current world ranked number one side. They're out of the smoke and the fire. And they await GB, who come out here on home court, undefeated throughout this Quad Nations competition and looking to lay down a marker here on home soil ahead of their Paralympic defence later in the summer. Quad Nations really is a very, very key competition in terms of the build-up to the big dance in Paris. The whole design of this tournament is to replicate Paralympic conditions as best they can. That includes the timings of coming out, the razzmatazz with the smoke and the pyrotechnics and the anthems that we're just about to enjoy. Yeah, there's very few opportunities where these teams get to play each other throughout the year, so, so having a tournament list is absolutely vital.
Always an atmospheric and emotional time when you get to sing your national anthem whilst representing your nation. And especially so here at the Wheelchair Rugby Quad Nations taking place in Cardiff. And the final throws, these final blasts and accelerations to get the wheels hot and also the personal engines rev. What are the conversations that are taking place here now, Jim, amongst the whole group? Oh, just, just making sure that all the teams know their, their key messages, all the players know what their roles are on court. We just saw in front of us the four starting GB players just get that final little bit of pump into their arms, make sure they're ready to go. And who are the leaders in there? You, you know, you mentioned mention the captain but there are some very experienced heads across the board in there yeah i mean Stu robinson is leading the lines at the moment anytime he's on the court you know that he's going to be pulling the strings gavin walker obviously he's been around now he's seen a few paralympic games so he's going to be absolutely pushing this squad forward well here we go this is the semi-finals of the quad nations and for those of you who are new so wheelchair rugby, you are in for a treat. Four eight-minute quarters of high-octane action where collisions are the name of the game, but also a lot of strategic teamwork in terms of locking up opposition players and releasing the speedsters to register points on the board. All of the athletes out there are classified from 0.5 to 3.5 in terms of their functional ability and the four players who are on the court can only have a maximum collective score of eight in the classifications that is unless there is a female athlete among them and then an extra 0.5 is added to that eight value so you see right there Stu Robinson wearing three. Josh Wheeler wearing 10 two High classification players expect plenty of points to come from those two. And GB with the early possession. And first across the paint in this match. Always what you want to do. You want to win the tip. You want to set the tone off right. And that was great start for GB. So here's the inbound and that's Chuck Aoki. And he's linking up there with Josh Wheeler. 2.5 classification and zips away. Find space nice and easy. And uh, it's going to be, we're going to have a bit of a back and forth here early in the exchanges, aren't we? We are. And, and, and there's some really experienced guys on the court at the moment. Obviously, Chuck Oki being one, but Josh Wheeler is, one, is super experienced at the moment. He's played on this US team for a number of years. Just looking there, uh, the way that so sort of the players are interacting and the jobs that everyone's up to. Here's Chuck Aoki, the much fated Chuck Aoki again, linking up with Wheeler. And everyone, everyone does have a different role. You know, you're gonna see the glory boys, as it were, who, uh, who are making their way into the scoring key with regularity, but everyone else has a, a very nuanced, defined role out there, Jim. Yeah, and what we're seeing at the moment is both teams really spreading the court. They know that it's going to be hard to defend. There's a lot of really good hands on the court at the moment. So they're, they're spreading out, making the ball do a lot of the work. And the role of the lower classification players compared to those that we've seen scoring so far. Yeah, I mean, the, the low point players are there to block. And we just saw a prime example of that where uh, one of the low point players managed to block uh, Sarah Adam and we GB get the first turn over the game. And we see Sarah Adam have to go to the penalty bin for, uh, for reaching in there on Jamie, trying to rectify her mistake. So there's the penalty bin there and Sarah Adam will stay there for, well, the next 60 seconds, unless there are there is a score by GB, then should be released. And the USA are going to allow Stu Robinson to just cruise across for that one. Chuck Aoki again 
linking up with Wheeler. He shows a nice swerve right at the end to get across for the try. So one thing that we saw really good from USA yesterday against Japan is they move the ball so well. There's always a passing outlet for them. Josh Wheeler will be that. Sarah Adam will be that. When, when Chuck gets stuck, you know the ball's going to move somewhere else. Sue Robinson. Oh, just a little bit of a handling error, but GP recovered. And it's a good opportunity for the USA here, with GB under a bit of pressure, looking to find a way through. Just in the nick of time. Just in the nick of time, Matt. You were right there. Jamie and Jack doing a brilliant job to screen there for Stuart. So that the shot clock counting down, you heard everyone here getting that little bit louder as the seconds click to one. That's 40 seconds. The attacking team is allowed in possession to score. And that's really important. What we heard there was the GB bench getting really loud, letting the guys on court know exactly what time was left on that clock. And time out there from Stuart Robinson, I think. Really good defense from USA. GB just weren't progressing up the court as fast as they liked, so they used their, one of their get out of jail free cards and call a timeout. So the timeout called there because USA, as you said, were pressing GB in their half of the court. 12 seconds to get across the halfway line, and sometimes those timeouts used strategically because you're under the cosh like that. Yeah, and, and, and it was a really good defense from USA. 12 seconds, as you mentioned, to get out across the halfway. And if you're not going to do it, it's better to burn the timeouts than to, to burn a turnover. So just a replay of some of the action that we've enjoyed so far. In a tight match, and it's one that USA are trailing only momentarily because that's a big turnover. Massive turnover. That'll be a huge play for USA. They, they managed to get GB to use a, a timeout and to, they managed to get a turnover. So USA will be absolutely ecstatic with that set of play. Stu Robinson's had his pocket picked by Chuck Aoki there. And that is two in quick succession that has spun this opening quarter in favor of the USA. Yeah, all that good work, early doors from GB, winning the tip, getting the first turnover, has all been completely wiped away by that passage of play from USA. Well, you got Joe Delagrave down there with the headphones on, who became coach in the aftermath of being a player in that Paralympic final. And well, he curiously said, said he was very at peace with the game despite the loss in the final. He felt that coaching was the right time for him. And he's really done a, done a great job with this USA team. Oh, he's, he's a phenomenal asset for the USA, whether that be on the court as a player or, or as a coach. I was lucky enough to play with Joe in, in Phoenix for a number of years, and he, and he really brings a sense of, of calm, and he's such a student of the game. He, he'll know exactly what he's looking for, for from his players today. He knows exactly what it's like to be out in the heat of battle in wheelchair rugby, made his international debut back in 2010, and now making a really fine start to his coaching career. Shrew Robinson looking to simply bully his way through and tell you what, there's a few fender benders out there. USA working really hard in defence. Yeah, you see Chuck Oki there, he, he was really chasing the ball hard. Managed to get back on top of the plate numerous times, so he is absolutely massive for USA on their defensive sets. So 7-6, USA lead. Big collision coming in from Aoki, rattling Kieran Flynn momentarily, but he's shown great composure there. And Robinson should get the job done from here, which he does. I mentioned that in the build-up. Kieran Flynn, he's one of those new players to GB, but, but such a cool head on his shoulders. He really is 
coming into his own in this tournament. For you, like, how long does it, did it take to bed into a national programme? Because there is such great consistency across all the nations with the players. We see so many of these individuals who've been to multiple Paralympics. So to come into the environment and make your mark, and it, it must be quite challenging. It really is, is different for each individual. Kieran comes from a rugby background, so he has that sporting mindset. Myself, I came from a rugby background, but it really took me a lot longer than it's taking him to sort of find my way at the international stage. Well, there's the cool heads of Kieran that you mentioned, seeking out his captain, Gavin Walker. As Jamie Stead looks on from the sideline, ready to be deployed. One of those gold medalists from Tokyo. It's a funny old thing, the quad nations. The essence of the competition, the, the makeup means that you're guaranteed a semi final. So, USA have come into this, ranked the one in the world. They haven't won here all weekend. And as we're seeing, it's a different USA now in this semi final against GB. You haven't lost all weekend. No, USA have. Obviously, this is a tournament where. Any team can test any line during during the first few games. They know they're going to get a semi-final spot. Now is when it really counts. Now is the knockout. Now is when teams want to be making that impact, making their mark ahead of Paris 2024. Chuck Aoki slaloming his way and taking his time. Tell us, tell us, Jim, why do players delay the act of scoring in wheelchair rugby? So at the moment, we've got um, a GB player in the bin for, for reaching, I believe. And so what USA are trying to do is they're trying to trap him in the penalty box uh, with their low point player. That didn't happen. Um, so now we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see what USA try and do here. Well, the big long ball is too awkwardly bounced for the captain to take, and Aoki's on it. And USA have got a great opportunity here, long over the top, beautifully weighted, and Clayton Brackett onto it. So that's exactly what USA were doing on that last play. They were delaying scoring the try so that they could set their defense perfectly. And that's exactly what we saw. They got, got the turnover straight off that. Another inaccuracy from GB, and after that bright start, it really is USA's quarter at the moment. Momentum has really swung, and it and it does in this game. We'll see we'll see numerous momentum swings, and where one team's up, but definitely all one-way traffic for USA at the moment. A lot can happen. A lot can happen in a in a game of wheelchair rugby, can't it? We're only, well, six minutes into the opening quarter. So plenty of twists and turns to come. And I, I remember in the Quad Nations, the year of the Paralympics last time, you get into extra time against USA, in fact. I think uh, in the semi-finals at this stage last time. So a lot of drama to be had here on this final day. Chuck Aoki in the points again. Yeah, we've seen a, a line change here from GB as well. They've brought on Aaron Phipps as well as Duke Robinson. So there'll be a lot of pace on the court right now. But Aaron Phipps right on the ball early, distinctive by that headband and distinctive by the sheer speed of the man. One of the fastest on the court in international wheelchair rugby. GB9, USA 11. Less than two minutes remaining of this opening stanza. Mason Simons first. Touch of importance on the court. Chuck Aoki does the rest. And, and what we're seeing now is USA are really looking to start to manage that clock. We're getting towards the end of the quarter. Scoring the last goal is really important in wheelchair rugby. If you've got the possession arrow, it means that you could have up to a two-goal swing 
going into quarter two. Oh, the defence really has been mighty from USA. Everywhere she Robinson turns, he's finding a USA dead end. And a turnover, USA ball. That's that's a really big, big turnover for USA right at the end of the quarter. They're just gonna looking to extend that that lead that they've they've managed to get grab. Mason Simons, the big 55, finds Aoki. He goes long and Chuck Melton does really well to hold on to that as he gets clattered by Robinson and he's really getting hassled by Phipps as well. Yeah, GB know they need to try and force something from USA now. Patience shown by Aoki Simons. He's a big man, isn't he? I think we're going to see a time right here from USA. So what USA have done there is they, they know that they didn't have enough on their shot clock to see out the end of the quarter. So what they've done is they've, they've called a timeout with 15 seconds left on the game clock. It then resets them to 15 seconds, which will give them 15 seconds to score. Should guarantee them the last goal of the quarter. And they changed the line as well for the moment also. So here they are, USA, clock ticking down. Less than 10 on the boards here in the arena. Aoki fakes, gets really hassled and harried and makes it across the line with just one second on the clock. And that'll be the quarter and it's one the USA will be very, very pleased with. They lead GB 13-9. USA laser focused there, weren't they? They really were. It was it was an amazing start from GB. They they won the tip. They got the first turnover. It all looked really promising. But yeah, as you mentioned, laser focused. USA have really cranked up that intensity. Well, here we are, Joe Delagrave, right in there bringing great energy as well as the knowledge. And this is how it all unfolded. You mentioned that bright start. GB off to a fly with the first score of the game. Then they got the turnover. And yep. it really was all traveling in the direction of the uh, the team in white. But this might this might have just been the turning point for USA, that turnover. Yeah, they got, they, they got lucky on a, on a couple in inception pass, but in wheelchair rugby, you really do make your own luck. And while there, there can be some individual errors with some bad passing there, we saw one from Stuart Robinson. It all comes from that defensive pressure that USA have been able to exert. You've, um, you know, you've been the high classification go-to player like Stu Robinson. How much pressure is there upon you to perform? Because there is a real, well, there is the expectation of you to deliver the tries. So, you know, when things aren't quite going your way, how much does that build upon you as a player? Oh, it's enormous. You do really feel the pressure. Um, being that you've got the, the ball most of the time as a high point player, you, you have to be almost perfect. And all of these teams will be looking for around a 90% conversion rate, which means when you get the ball, you're pretty much expected to score. So, so yeah, when, when you start seeing the turnovers that we've seen, it, it really does rattle the players a little bit. Paul Shaw there, looking on at the landscape. It's a final that he would love to be reaching, which is coming up later today. Four matches of wheelchair rugby here in Cardiff. So if you're in the locality and you're enjoying what you're seeing, it's not too late to get on down to the Sport Wales National Centre because we've got France, Japan, next in the semi-final and then it's the medal matches this afternoon wall to wall wheelchair rugby but right now as the hooter blows 
USA are leading Great Britain 13 points to nine. And you mentioned the possession arrow. USA are waiting patiently to get us underway. Talk us through that possession arrow in the game. Yeah, so in, at the start of the game, we have a tip off, which is basically essentially a jump ball. Um, of GB were the first to win that. So if there isn't a jump ball throughout the rest of that quarter, then it automatically goes to the opposite team, which in this case was, was USA. Um, so that's why scoring the last goal was so important for USA. It basically gave them a two goal swing going into this quarter. Well, a two goal swing when they already had a, a break as it were. And that's why they lead 14 points to nine. And again, that hustle from the Americans coming hard. GB have the inbound. Yeah, and we, ju we just saw a jump ball there. So the possession arrow now will switch. So if there isn't another jump ball for the rest of this quarter, USA will start the second half with the ball as well. So all these mini moments that unfold in the quarter, having a big impact on the more major moments later in the match. Look at that D from the USA. They are ravenous at the moment. No way through for Stu Robinson and co. No, GB are really looking rattled at the moment. They're not finding a way through that really strong American key defense. Well, there was the burst from Sarah Adam. Then a little triangle with Chuck Aoki and Josh Wheeler unlocks the GB defence once more. Oh, these are two big strong balls locking horns, aren't they? Robinson and Aoki. They've, uh, they seem to be finding each other with regularity and it's a great contest. Yeah, two of the best players in the world. You really are seeing some amazing talent on, on show here in Cardiff this, this week. Here's a fine bit of play from Ball. Sarah Adam. Offense looking really easy for USA at the moment. I think GB need to step up their defense to try and try and put a bit of rattle into uh, to what America are doing. USA looking slick and USA just prowling the key, inviting GB to come and shoot their shot, which Shu Robinson does in bullying fashion, that's through the defences. Once again, you mentioned that ease. It feels like GV are really having to battle for every try at the moment, whilst USA are just flying down. They are. So what USA are doing really well at the moment is they're spreading that court, making it hard for GB to pressure the defence. Saying that, we just get a coast-to-coast -coast got try there from Stu Robinson. Well, that's a big pressure reliever, you know. That's, that's really the easiest score that GB have had in some time. And they've got a big defensive set coming up here now. And they, like USA, wait to engage. Chuck Aoki finds the ball. That presence of mind. How do you keep a cool head when you're, when you're being set upon by three chairs? It's really difficult. So key, running a key attack was always my least favourite part of the game. Uh, you, you're operating in really confined spaces. There's hands coming in from everywhere. You've got to try and see which is the best option. Sometimes there might not even be one. And then you've got to have the clarity of mind to reset. Nice little weave and the shift of balance from Stu Robinson. But again, Aoki and Wheeler working in unison. The long ball out to the edge. Doesn't quite find a way. And, well, it's really well worked. It had to be, had to be precise in close confines. And GB get their try. 18-13, they still trail. Oh, and a coast-to-coast -coast one for USA. And that is... That's heartbreaking because it was so hard for GB to score that last try and America make it look so easy.
USA continuing to bring the noise as sparks fly down in the GB half. Lovely ball over the top there, having soaked up the hits. And in rolls Nick Cummins. Yeah, and that was great from Jamie Stead. What he was doing was he was, he was slowing the pace down, following his picks, letting the play develop, and then Nick was the perfect outlet for him. Oh, Wheeler is denied. He's got Adam with him. Out the back door to Aoki. Who is a man who never looks flustered. And just like that, has the confidence to go back, rebuild, and look to strike. Over the top to Adam. He slips it into reverse. More points to the USA. Yeah, and you mentioned Chuck Aoki there. Never looks flustered. Cool as you like. He's been around this game for so long now. He knows exactly what he's doing. He knows where he wants his players to be. Always communi communicating with them on court. Just one of the absolute best in this game. Again, the path not clear for Stu Robinson, but that's a beautiful ball over the top. Stretches Stead. Really well set up from GB. Jonathan Coggan there providing a perfect corner block and providing that pocket that Stuart could pass into. Johnny Coggan was very much the foil for you in, uh, in your heyday. Uh, how, like, what's that connection like? between players, between players with, with those different roles, how much communication, how much chat is going on on court? Oh, talking constantly. So as a high point player, I'd always be talking to Johnny. Uh, he'd always be talking back to me saying, yeah, come this way. I need you to pick. I'll tell him I need you to pick left, right. Go push hard now. So there's always that co communication. But what really helps is, is playing together for a long time and having, having that real sort of chemistry that you build on court sort of developing that telepathy. Absolutely, that's what, what it's all about. Well, we've spoken quite a bit about how hard GB have had to work, but conversely, how easy it's been for USA. And, you know, we see there Sarah Adams having a, r a really big say on this match. She seems to be finding space with great ease. Yeah, and what she's doing really well is she's taking Stuart or she's taking Jamie Long. Um, they have to mark her. They have to respect her as a high point player. But what it's doing then, it's allowing Josh Wheeler and Chuck Aoki a lot of space to push into. Um, and then when, when, they, when the GB have to defend them, it leaves her wide open. So really smart from Sarah Adams, spacing the court really well and, and, give it, and providing that long option. Well, she's providing a great option for Aoki, who is very much the quarterback of this USA outfit. And... Here, you've got a key attack now, haven't you? Because USA are all set back there, inviting GB on. Shu Robinson is pushed wide. So USA there got called for four in the key. So you're only allowed to have three players in your defensive key zone. Uh, and Lee Fadet there being the last last man in, so he's getting has it, having to go to the penalty box. Aaron Phipps. There's real pace and power with both of them on the court. And it's it's oh so easy. Not running down the clock there at all or looking to, to set the defence on that occasion. No, I think what, what GB really need to do now is to make some turnovers, and th which is why they've probably brought Aaron and Stu back on. They're looking to make that physical impact, start to shake um, what USA are doing a little bit more. Oh, there we go. There's that physicality, but it's matched by the composure of Aoki. Just under three minutes remaining of the opening half, and it's one that USA 
thus far have dominated. It's reflected justly on the scoreboard. And Phipps, who is all pace and explosion, careers into a couple of challenges, then circumvents them. So what we saw GB do really well there. So they've, been, they've struggled against USA's key defence. So they purposefully kept one of USA's players out of the, the defensive set. Almost a turnover there for GB. Stu, Stu got some fingers to it, but not quite enough. A sniff of an interception. They may not have stuck for Stu Robinson, but that, that sort of puts that shade of doubt though as well. Even, even though it might not have come out away in GB hands, USA will be thinking, well, there is that threat. A little, a little bit. You, you always want those ones to go your way, but luckily for USA, it, it just seems one-way traffic at the moment. Hands in the cookie good jar there for Jack Smith. So off to the penalty box goes Jack Smith. He was pretty new into the wheelchair rugby scene back when you won the Paralympic Games. Well, you say new to the scene, so he's been playing club rugby in, in GB for a long time, Jack. He's a really experienced player. It was his first Paralympic Games, but but he's, he's been around this sport longer, th longer than myself and, and really brings that experience with him. It's tough in the classification that he's in. So he's going up against Johnny, Jonathan Coggan, who, if he makes it to Paris, will be his sixth Paralympic Games. That's incredible, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. To be, to be able to be competing at that level for that long, it just shows how dedicated and, and what an athlete he is. Well, Stu Robinson, for once, finds a bit of safe passage to score a try. He has been shunted and buffeted around for much of this opening half, and Chuck Aoki has looked in relative cruise control at times. Spins out of that collision. Despite the attention of Phipps and Co., Sees a, a route through the fog. Brilliant hit coming in from Robinson. USA under a bit of pressure and fingertips coming in. Robinson upended. Oh, there was, a, there was an awful lot going on there for the referee to make a decision. I think it's been given GB ball. He's getting a lot of... Well, she's getting a lot of extra added opinions from both USA and GB players. I think I think Chuck Oakey's got something to say on that one. Really good defensive effort from Stu there. He knew the pass was coming, backed up enough that he got a fingertip to it. I think it came off Chuck Oakey's chair. There was also when when Stuart went over, he did actually land on Chuck Oakey's chair. So. So it could have been called a penalty against GB, but the referee not seeing that one. Well, long and over the top, and you can feel an injection of energy in the arena as GB go coast to coast. What a pass from Jack Smith there, just bumping it over the top of everyone, the confidence to do that. We saw Brian Cowling do that a lot in, in Tokyo, but yeah, love to see that coming into the game. Well, there's one turnover that GB needed. 23-19, make that 24-19 as we approach the final 60 seconds of this half. And we have a brief pause for some running repairs for Shu Robinson. This is uh, not an atypical scene. A few wheelchair uh, wheel changes to be expected, and this was that beautiful pass that opened up the opportunity for GB there. Robinson with a fresh wheel on his steed, and he gets off and underway. 
players pour into that key area despite the mass of bodies he finds a way through and we're seeing what we what we discussed in the other uh, start of the or the end of the first quarter we're getting towards the end of the second quarter now and, and teams are starting to look at running that clock down making sure that they're going to be the ones that are scoring last goal just a bit of a juggle gets everybody very excited here but USA retain possession Mason Simons to Aoki. If I were USA here, I might look at calling a timeout. We can see Aoki has got his eyes yeah. right on the clock, looking to wind it down. And that's exactly what they've done. So, as in the first quarter, they've they've called the timeout with 15 seconds left on the game clock, gives them the opportunity to score last goal. They will have the arrow coming out of the for the second half. So this could be another two goal swing for them if they convert. There's a lot going on out there, isn't there? You're not just uh, worrying about the opposition and where your teammates are, you've got an eye on the clock as well. Yeah, you, you have to be aware of so many things in this game. Uh, there, there are so many little tactical intricacies that, that if you're a first time watcher of the sport, you'll be like, why are they taking all this time? But but really, it, it can make the difference between winning and losing at this level. Well, that is an artfully managed clock. 0.5 of a second means there'll be no time to strike for GB. And the USA may well applaud themselves because that is a half well navigated. And it's they who lead GB 25-20 after the second quarter. Yeah, USA can be really happy with that half. Though I think they've they've shown that they were probably dominant throughout. Um, and yeah, five points up going into going into half time, you've got to be happy with that. Not an insurmountable deficit, though. Five points. And that quarter, well, it started for USA really where they left off. Scoring, having had the possession arrow and being the last to score in the first arrow, then at the first quarter, and then those sticky paws in amongst the GB players. And she's been really, really impressive, Sarah Adams. She's had a big impact on the scoreboard. But GB, have, they've begun to find their groove late in this quarter. Yeah, and I think GB are perhaps trying to force things a little bit. You mentioned with the sticky hands there. They're getting called now on a few reaching fouls, so, so they need to be aware that perhaps that's not what the referees are looking for. They need to be trying to get put the pressure on in other areas, try and force USA into some bad situations rather than trying to expect the reach. In, in rugby, one ex an expression that's used quite a lot in the game is, is painting pictures for the referee. It's that perception that the referee has in the game of, of who's doing what. Is that equally to be said in wheelchair rugby? You mentioned about those reaching fouls. Is that planting a seed in the referee's mind that, oh, actually, I, mean, I need to look out for that and maybe I should be penalising more? That's exactly what they're doing. So GB are trying to force something and they're trying to force something at the moment by reaching in. The referees are seeing that more and more and they're realising that, yeah, I need to be keeping an eye on that. And, and we're seeing GB being penalised for it. So, yeah, they need to be aware of that going forward. Well, it certainly won't be panic stations here at the Sport Wales National Centre for GB. A lot of game to play, but he's a man that they need to try and mollify. What, what, what do you do about Chuck Aoki? There's not a lot you can do with <laughs> someone that good. I mean, he is he's so strong. He's been part of this game, I've said, for a number of years now, and, and he, he's got such an experienced head on his shoulders that, that he's a very hard man to rattle. What GB need to be doing is forcing the ball into his teammates' hands. Keep it out of his hands. Make other people make decisions and make other people make mistakes. Easier said than done. <laughs> Easier said than done. Oh, we've just nearly, nearly been wiped out by a ball here, court side. <laughs> There's uh, some of the players who are yet to see quite so much action, keep themselves warm, keep themselves primed 
for action whilst a few other messages are being shared between experienced players and coaches. Speaking of, we caught up with the GB coach, Paul Shaw. Let's hear. Coach Paul, a great competition so far, two victories for Great Britain. Um, most important, uh, the team is doing great and we are very close to Paris. So how is the road to Paris so far? Well, this is great preparation for Paris. Um, getting to play these teams, you know, this is a real test to see where we are at the moment. And yes, we've been fortunate, we've had two good wins, but we had a really good plan going into those games. So this has been a, a really good, exciting tournament and everybody from Cardiff coming in to watch as well has been added to that atmosphere. So absolutely, it's a good great. So it's a great vibe uh, to uh, to be preparing for, for this next big competition that's going to be the, Olymp the uh, Paralympics. Yeah, I mean, the Paralympics is the uh, pinnacle of that four-year cycle and to be in Paris, which is just over the way, over the channel, which is great. And um, yeah, we're really, really looking forward to it and excited about all the preparation going into uh, Paris as well. So. And how do, you, how do you feel the team? Do you think the, the team is ready? That's that's where they're supposed to be right now, in your opinion? At this moment, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, we've got cycles of how the athletes, where they need to be at this moment in time. And yeah, we're in a really good position and I'm, I'm really pleased. All the work that everybody's doing that, you know, all the staff and everybody have Got the team in a good place at the moment, so we're really excited what we can achieve going into the Paris. Thank you, and uh, good luck. Thank you very much.
Joe Delagrave getting in to his USA team with a final on the line. This is day three of what has been an unbelievable few days here in Cardiff at the Wheelchair Rugby Quad Nations. We are back, back on court and back ready to see who will be our first finalist. The opening half of this semi-final has very much been about the team in blue. They have the possession, they have the inbound to get us underway. It's USA leading Great Britain 25 points to 20. This is just a taste of the action to come in the big dance itself, the Paralympics in Paris coming up and this one of the most significant tournaments in the build-up to the big event. It is. I mean, there's only one more big tournament before Paris, so teams are really looking to fine-tune now and, and this is one of the absolute best opportunities to do that. We've got four of the absolute best teams in the world here at the moment and, and we're getting to see some amazing rugby. The watermark is very, very high indeed when it comes to the Quad Nations. It is invitation only and really the desire is to have the very, very best in the world. That's why you're seeing GB, the Paralympic champions, up against the world ranked number one USA in the semi-final. Next up, it's France, the European champions, up against perennial competition favourites Japan. It is wall-to-wall -wall talent here in Cardiff this weekend. And it's a smart start. And Japan, as you mentioned, are just coming off an, an Asia Oceana Championship win as well. So they're in some really good form at the moment. And each, each team bringing a, a, sort of a different blend, a different way that they approach the game. Yeah. I mean, you'll see USA really strong passing team GB will mainly try and run the ball through players like Stu Robinson and Aaron Phipps Japan have got a number of really good high point players and then France as well they've got a really good number of high point players and they'll they'll try and predominantly run the ball through Jonathan Ivane which we'll see a bit later today and this court that we have here in Cardiff specially laid for the Quad Nations. This is this is the same style of court that you'll get in Paris at the Paralympics. And that it's not always the case around the world, depending on the competitions that players compete in. So we spoke about the intro, the anthems, that atmosphere of being at a big game event that the Quad Nations tries to replicate, but right down to the very wood on the floor. This is all about replicating what it will feel like in Paris come the summer. Yeah, I've got an interesting fact. So in, in Tokyo, the floor actually was a little, wasn't completely flat in Tokyo. The floor, because it had an aircon system underneath it, took on moisture and sometimes it felt like pushing along a plaid field. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I had no idea. Well, so you had, to, you had to adapt to those conditions. You did and there were a couple weird bounces of the ball and you were like, well, that wasn't expected and, and yeah, so or it, like it was fair for all the teams, but I mean, it was definitely something we weren't expecting. So that and coupled with the, the arena being empty as well because because of COVID as well. No, I mean, it was, it was a special game just, just because of, of what it meant and what we managed to achieve. But obviously we would have loved to have our families there and, and a lot of the guys that continued on to play, that's why they've continued on. They want to get their family there. They want to be involved in the games where the full crowd and get that full Paralympic experience. 
There were some nice moments out there. They brought, they did bring in school children uh, and some of the volunteers as well. Um, yeah. Dur during games. So, in so during that. during the final, um, we had a lot of the Team GB staff that were there with the rest of Paralympics GB. So we actually had a really loud crowd. It was it was it was special in its own right. Was a very very special occasion, and an incredible feat for GB wheelchair rugby. It really propelled it into the public conscience as well. What was that like for, for you guys when you when you came back? It, honestly, unbelievable. Um, we'd, we'd had the, the, the Rio games where we'd, we came fifth and we'd pretty much forgotten about it. Well, when we came back from, from Tokyo, it, it was just amazing. The reception that we got was, was unbelievable and we can't thank the British public enough. I think there were a lot of bleary-eyed people at work uh, back in that summer on Tokyo time, but it was worth being along for what was an unbelievable ride with GB, and it was one that climaxed in a contest against these guys here, USA, who were denied gold again at a Paralympic final, but again beginning to peak and beginning to run pretty red hot the world ranked number one side and they're putting in a good showing here in Cardiff, leading 28 points to 23. That talisman, first to the bounce of the ball, just as Fitz thought he'd poached one. And look at that, one, two. I'm not entirely sure what happened there because <laughs> the ball went into the front court and then came back. So I think that was an over and back from USA and I think that should have been a, a turnover to GB. Well, Aaron Phipps actually was he the one that touched well, it? Well, he well he was the one who sort of appealed to the referees, didn't he? Yeah, so maybe he was of the same school of thought as you. Well, Yoki gets his paw in there. Really fast hands there from Chuck trying to pick off that pass. Changing line, changing personnel for GB. Jack Smith, almost, almost. Chuck Hokey, he's everywhere at the moment. Yeah, another fast set of hands again from Chuck. What was really close is Gavin Walker actually almost left the court before the ball did, so that would have been a turnover, but luckily the, the fast hands from Chuck kept the ball in GB's possession. Eventually, GB break down this stubborn USA defence. And they're not hanging around. Aoki, 1-2, back on the ball, linking up with Brackett. And then he really accelerates, gets the revolutions going. And Aoki goes key to key, and it's more points on the board. And we just saw why he's so key. So what Chuck is, he's so strong in traffic. He just, even though it doesn't seem like there's any space, he forces his way through, uses his picks really well. He has tremendous upper body strength. You can sort of see the muscularity of the man in his shoulders and arms. That's how he generates that power. And as you say, that ability to work his way through heavy traffic. Speaking of traffic, GB is snarled up here. Great ball to Robinson. His line is read by Aoki. Three on three. Oh, just a bit of a juggle, but eventually in there for Gavin Walker. It's still looking a little bit tough for GB at the moment. The scores are coming that much easier for USA. Aoki has to reach for that ball from O'Neill. And off go USA again. Back to O'Neill, it's really, really nicely worked. Elegant bit of play, that. Well, here we are 
this is that is Aoki to O'Neill completing the one two nicely done and Stu Robinson understandably he probably gets his wheels changed the most out, out there who's who saw the who ha yeah, has you'll, the biggest wear and tear on. You'll usually see the high pointers have their wheels changed the most, and that's because the low pointers in the picking chairs, the defensive chairs, tend to target the high pointers the most. So that's where we'll see the punches and, and the and the smashed up wheels come from. Another nuance of the game, the more attacking minded players, the difference in the chairs, the maneuverability of the chairs of the likes of Robinson, Aoki, Bracket who's on here, but he's getting locked up by Jack Smith, who's got that picker at the front, which is designed to try and trap the opposition player. Wow, high speed collisions out there. Aoki manages to find a way out of that traffic, and he also finds a way to pick out Josh O'Neill. Yeah, and he's really stamping his authority on this game, is Chuck. He's he's almost looking unstoppable at the moment. Tricky ball for Gavin Walker to collect, and you know who's on his shoulder. Racket spins out of contact. Wow, that's good from Fredette. Robinson was coming round to try and affect that attack but he got all locked up i think that's the first turnover of the quarter as well so that was that was big for usa keeping their momentum making sure that they're the ones on the on the upper hand just a really awkward one for gavin there to grab it just came in low on his wheel awkward as as a two-point player gavin doesn't have an, an awful lot of core movement so being able to reach down and grab that from the bottom of his wheel would have been really tricky Time for a timeout. Seven points. The difference, it was five at the turn of the game. USA stretching their lead and stretching GB at the moment. Instead, really has to grapple his way free, but he does so before he's set upon once again by Sarah Adam. He's back on court and that being as impactful as ever. Time ticking down here for GB. 10 seconds on the clock. Back to Stead. But just again, really hard for GB to score. Almost running the entire 40 seconds down. USA's defense is looking incredibly strong. Great pressure on Wheeler. And he's got his buddy on his shoulder. Aoki again, he beckons his team back with him towards the halfway line. They're gonna reform and they're gonna strike. Wheeler looks to run the screen, but Aoki still can't find a way through. Taking three to shut the maestro out, but somehow, somehow he finds the pass. Yeah, really that is ridiculous. Really strong. And he was probably getting close to being 10 seconds in the key there on, on an offensive play. So he was probably starting to panic, but just shows the character of the man. Just Super calm, managed to get a pass off under immense pressure. The forest of arms finding a way through, and that's a nice long ball over the top to Nick Cummins, who does the rest. GB up against it. Last two minutes of this third quarter. Trailing by six. Aoki calling the shots. Robinson looking to melt him there. And Adam, free, unmarked, and cruising home. Yes, yeah, so what Josh Wheeler did there, he got into the front court, provided a post option, and then could either dump the ball back off to 
Sarah Adam or Chuck Aoki streaming up his other side. It just looks a little bit too easy at the moment. And he's said post option there, almost sort of like a striker holding the ball up in football and then laying it off to another player, another player on the edge. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what he was doing. He saw that it was a little bit tricky for USA to get out of the half. GB had put on a fairly decent press there. But so what he did, posted up, gave his team an option to pass to, and then he was just a distributing option in the front court. A minute 20 remaining of the quarter. And well, this is when clock management begins to come into the minds of everyone as we look at yeah. Sue Robinson. So teams will generally start looking to manage the clock from about three minutes out. And all, all of the teams here, that, that's what they'll be aiming to do. They'll be aiming to get hit those main time markers. So the key one will be around 50 seconds. That guarantees that you're really going to get a shot at a last goal. A lot of strategy. It looks like crash bang wallop out there, but it really is a chess match as well. Timing is everything. GB, Stu Robinson is everything. He's the main man. And he just about squeezes it to Ooh. Jamie Stead, who in turn squeezes himself across. Really good strength there from Jamie. He was under a lot of pressure from Sarah and Josh. Just managed to eke his chair over using his elbows. And here's that golden mark of 50 seconds. USA in possession with Adam. Almost, almost picked off by GB, but USA retain. Ayoki takes his foot off the pedal, off the accelerator, after a bit of calmness. I think USA might look to run another time out here. Take the, take the shot clock all the way down, give GB as little time as possible. How frustrating is this for you as a player as well? It's obviously a known tactic, but you know, seeing the, the intentions, not time wasting, but certainly time managing. Yeah, and, and GB will be a little bit frustrated that they haven't been able to manage the clock quite as well as they wanted. It, and, and in fact, GB probably are managing the clock quite well. And what USA are doing to counter it is that they're having to use these timeouts, but because the pressure hasn't been there from, from GB defense, Oh, have we seen a turn at? No, we've seen Jamie go to the bin. So another reset here. This will just help USA close out this quarter now. Yeah, legal use of hands from Jamie there. So while, well, sorry, going back to what I was mentioning, while GB have been managing the clock, what USA have been doing to counteract that is they've been utilizing their timeouts at the end of the quarters. And we've seen that in all three quarters so far, just to ensure that they get that last goal attack. Aoki collects, and he won't be in a hurry to score here. He's going to want to leave as little time as possible for GB to respond. And they've managed the clock expertly. One second in the first quarter, half a second in the second. 2.7 for this. This needs to be some Hail Mary, but instead, Shu Robinson just holds on, says enough's yeah. enough, we're going to have to go hard or go home in the fourth. No, and, and USA have stretched that quarter out by another another two scores, so, so really are looking like the dominant team at the moment. End of the third quarter. GB 30, USA 37. And a lot to like about this USA performance. Chuck Aoki really is dominating proceedings both sides of the ball. And as he said, Jim, that lead stretching out by another couple of points and just how big a mountain is a seven-point deficit to overturn in a quarter. At this level, it, it's pretty huge. I'm not, not going to lie. I, ha, I have seen it. Um, I've seen teams implode, but I don't think we're going to see that from USA. They just look too comfortable at the moment. Unless, unless 
Cap or Coach Joe Delagrave really wants to experiment, I, I don't see this going any other way than USA at the moment. Um, that being said, I'm hoping that that GB will make some tactical changes and, and we'll see a, an improvement from them. It's a tough one, these competitions, because you mentioned, you know, this is the penultimate sort of major tournament for the Paralympics. You want to give your combinations, your established combinations as much time as possible, but you've also got to give plenty of oxygen to, to other players and new combinations. So it's that balance of experimentation, but also giving minutes on the clock, minutes in the wheels for, for all of the, the players that you know are going to be your, your A team, your gun team. That's that's right. You really want to be, like you said, giving the prime minutes to your main lineups, the ones that you know they're going to be performing for you in the Paralympics. But at the same time, you don't know what can happen. Injuries can happen. People can get ill. So you need to be bedding in that bench, making sure that they know their roles if they are needed and called upon. GB very much up against it. Trailing USA 37 points to 30 with these two met in the opening match of this Quad Nations competition back on Tuesday. And it was GB who were victorious 57 45. I think the difference in that game was uh, Chuck Oki was, was absent. He was suffering from what I believe to be food poisoning. And we, we can just see what an impact he's had in this game. USA, there's no doubt about it. They're a different beast. When Chuck Aoki is in the starting lineup. And here's one of the newer faces of GB wheelchair rugby, Kieran Flynn. Getting stunned away. Jonathan Coggan, Gavin Walker and Stu Robinson to make up the quartet. Fredette, and you, uh, Melton and Aoki. USA just getting called for four defenders in the key there. You're only allowed three within your key defence zone and, and Chuck Aoki there being the last man in. So he's uh, been sent to the sim bin. A momentary respite for GB with Chuck Aoki off the court. Yeah, and really now GB need to be looking at how they can op um, make the most of this opportunity. Um, you want to try and set your defence now that you've got the power play. Make sure that perhaps Chuck is doing the inbounding, but that he doesn't have an option, an easy option to pass to. Aoki does have the inbounding and GB, as you said, looking to snarl up these USA players. So a really good piece of tactical nice there from coach Joe Delagrave. So what he's done is he's called a coach's timeout. He knew that GB had got their set defensively and he's just disrupted that by, uh, by calling the bench timeout. Yeah, they really have played brilliantly. USA, but they've also feel kind of in every act that they've had, they've, they've found a way to frustrate GB as well. No, they really have. It's been a, a proper technical display of, of how to play the game today from USA. GB won't give up, that's for sure. Oh, well, the shapes and the movement, fantastic from the USA. They know their offensive patterns so well. They know that some will be streaking long in that, that wide receiver position. Gavin Walker collects the pass from Stu Robinson. O'Neill with the inbound. Oh, bracket right, left. Frees up some room for himself. The captain's across to intervene. But still, USA on the ball. Aoki back in the pocket. Drifting round. Looking 
for his opportunity. And that opportunity, a pin perfect ball over the top to Clayton Brackett, who's done the wrap around. Passing has been absolutely terrific from the USA today. It has looked like hard work out there for GB defensively. Steve Robinson brings the power, brings the weave, and he brings a try. 33-39. There were some really good patterns from, from GB there, some really good pick and rolls, some really good sort of posting options from Kieran as well. So, so while the offense looks smooth from GB, it's, it's not quite as easy as they'd like to make it. Huge turnover there from GB. Managed to get Chuck Aoki on the over and back violation. So once you leave your backcourt, you cannot go back into it. And that's exactly what GB did there. They forced a turnover. Even if it's against your will, <laughs> because, because of a collision like that. Yeah, and you see Chuck Aoki apologizing to his bench as well. He knew that that was a, a silly error from him, something that you don't see often. Do, do you think they'll forgive him? given his other exploits in the match? I, w I wouldn't. <laughs> Exacting standards, Jim. <laughs> well, it has presented GB with an opportunity to close this gap. Much needed and a rare turnover, if we're being absolutely honest, for GB. Aaron Phipps brings the power and then brings the cool, calm and collected nature to pick out David Ross. Yeah, and we're seeing some big changes now from GB in terms of personnel. They've taken Stu Robinson off, which is the first time we've seen that all game. Uh, brought Aaron Phipps on and brought now um, David Ross on, who's a, a new, newer two-point player. And another turnover for GB. Well, is the tide turning very late in this game? Ross in pursuit. Ross on the court, making a big difference along with Phipps. 35-39. And there we see that tactical nice from Joe Delagrave again. He, he's seen there's been two turnovers in quite quick succession. He's just bringing his guys in, reaffirming what their roles are, making sure they know what they should be doing. Well, just a loose pass that proved too tricky very newbie to gather and it is fascinating the the use of timeouts how they can be used that you know there's the strategy but then there's also wants to sort of puncture the emotion of the moment and to you know to take the wind out of the GP south and it hasn't been successful because Ross is on the ball again yeah that was that was a really loose pass there from Josh Wheeler and such an easy pickup for 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 Dave Ross or chicken as he's affectionately known by his teammates. <laughs> I'm sure he'll thank you for, for broadcasting that today. Oh, wow, the fast hands of Aoki. Some anxious faces of the GB faithful. Get out in the Union Jack here in Cardiff. Wow, that really was a loose pass. Yeah, it, of concentration. It, it, it's almost as if he tried to pull it back in as as he went for the pass and and couldn't quite couldn't quite grab it back. Phipps steams in, offers so much menace. And he gets going. So what we saw there was absolutely brilliant work from GB's number five, Jack Smith. He set a perfect pick on the corner so that Dave had that free space to receive the pass into. Just showing why the low point is in this sport is so important. Not always, not always celebrated as much as they should be for, for some of their work off the ball. No, unsung, unsung heroes, absolutely. GB back within three tries. Here we go. I mean, do I come back to you with, after what you said uh, during the last breaking quarter? 
I will happily eat humble pie if, <laughs> if GB turn this around. And three turnovers, all back to back. And, and the importance of GB having the ball coming out at the quarter, that reduced the deficit from seven to six, and then three turnovers in quick succession. It's a long way to go, and we've got a bit of a hold up here. Not entirely sure what the referees have called here. Or whatever they called. Perhaps a, there was a perhaps a discrepancy on the clock, and they've reset to the last play. So GB will have to try and score that goal again. Will that try again. What because of a discrepancy on the clock? Yeah. So sometimes when when the game clock hasn't hasn't been operated operate correctly they'll revert to the last known timestamp on on the the score sheet so that that's what's happened in this instance um so gb have to now try and score this this try again well, that seems a tough break on gb it, it does and that's probably something that joe delagrave the coach the the astute student of the game that he is has picked up on um and, it, and he's looking after his team every every way he can I'm, I'm still confident that, that GB can uh, can put this point on the board. Well, further scrutiny of the stopwatch there. They're making absolutely sure on the timing, on the score. We've already seen yeah, throughout we'll this contest how, how key that clock management is. So back to five minutes and two seconds on the match clock. Fitz gets ahead of pace once again and tries to blow his way through the chairs and he does so with yeah. just raw power. And he is so strong and so fast. He's such an asset to this team. Music pumping, fans roaring, USA scoring for the first time in what feels like an age. Yeah, and what you saw Sarah there doing is just taking a little couple extra seconds off the clock. They know they've got the scoreboard advantage, so they're making sure they're, they're making it hard for GB. Aaron Phipps flying down the right edge, finding his captain. There's palpable new life here in the arena. If GB can get another turnover, it suddenly gets real interesting here. Suddenly feels like game's on, doesn't it? been in the doldrums for some time as USA have dominated in every facet. This has been the main man, Chuck Aoki. And again, he pulls the strings and orchestrates another score for Adam. USA making life tough for GB and that could be the game. All that pressure applied on the inbounds. Yeah, that's that's one that GB desperately didn't need. Pivotal turnover there for USA. Jack Smith surrounded by blue jerseys and a timeout had to be called. Suddenly, the pressure just cranking back up from USA again. There, they they seem to be a little bit rattled in the at the start of this quarter, but but now they're they're asserting their dominance once again. Difficult ball for David Ross to take. That was all a product of that USA pressure, as you said. He'll be disappointed with that one. I mean it. I always had the saying, if it touches your hands, you should have caught it, but that perhaps a little bit harsh. <laughs> any part, any part of the hand. Well, as well as the impact on the scoreboard, it just sort of sucked a bit of that life out of the arena, that bit of hope that was beginning to course through the GB players. There's three and a half minutes remaining of this final quarter. 
They trail the USA by five. A berth in the final on the line. This will be the first taste of defeat all weekend for GB, if it is to end that way. And David Ross is having a fine little cameo here. Bar, bar that handling error. No, he's, re he's really sort of imposed himself on, on this, this quarter and, and sort of putting his hand up as to why he should be selected in, in the lineups going forward. Aoki set free and Aoki predictably scoring. Ross to his captain, 1-2. Clattered by Aoki, who's back for more and Ross is getting hassled, but he's found an avenue away from the attentions of Aoki. Oh, gorgeous no look over the shoulder from Fitz, the captain in. GB still fighting. Looks to be a lot smoother offense from GB at the moment. They know where the passing options are going to be. All the lanes are filled for, for passing options. And, and yeah, it looks smooth, but at the same time, they're not putting enough pressure on, on USA's offense either. Wheeler takes his time. Every second that ticks down is a second in the USA's favor. The scoreboard is their friend. The clock, their friend. What can GB do? Fitz denied and then loses control. Just about regathers. Real scrabble for the ball down there. As he spins back on his wheel. And Aoki is in again. Oh. Little bit of indecision there from the referee. She wasn't quite sure whose hand that came off. I think it's it stayed as GB ball. Yeah, it's definitely. a devilish, devilish job refereeing this game. It really is. Sometimes we had to do it um, as part of our training camps, and and you, the amount of lip that you get off teammates and, and other players is <laughs> is is brutal. Did it make you more sympathetic on the court? When, as a player to uh, referee decisions that you may not have agreed oh, with. So I, so I always try to be friends with the referees because I know that some of the decisions can be so pivotal. And we just see a loose pass there from Aaron. Um, another turnover to USA. Well, speaking of pivotal decisions, that decision to go long and high over and across the key, not paying dividends for GB and Fitz takes his frustration out on the chair of Newby. And he's back on Wheeler, hunting down blue jerseys. Wheeler's going to get another little tune up here. But Aoki, cool, calm, and collected. Never in a rush. Yeah, and I think I think tactically what GB have done, they, they brought this line on. It made some turnovers really quickly, but USA seem to have figured it out now and, and have really applied the pressure probably should have seen another tactical change from GB just to counteract that swinging momentum. Ross. Ross. Going all the way. What a score. He was getting very close for 10 seconds, no dribble there as well, but luckily scored on the 30, so, so we'll let him have that one. <laughs> Wheeler free. Aoki all locked up back in the USA half of the court. So GB going two on three as far as the USA are concerned. UB just about getting the elevation and Aoki is arriving. I mean, just freed himself up. They've had to labour to that one but with 57 seconds left on the clock. Yeah, I think if, if I was USA, I'd look to have taken a couple more seconds off the clock there, but they'll be fairly happy that they've got a, a fairly comfortable lead at the moment. Phipps. Races down the court, picks out Ross. Nice fast strike, good counter. Just under 43 seconds to go, five points the difference. USA seemingly en route.
to another Quad Nations final. Disappointment for GB here on home court. Wheeler is going to be in no rush. Great steal from Phipps, who's not giving up, and he picks out his captain with a pin perfect bouncing ball. And that's what GB will be happy about. They've been absolutely relentless. No matter what the score's been, they've put all of their heart and soul into this. Try and claw it back. Our Phipps has brought great energy though, has he? He's a real nuisance. And that's one of the big strengths of his game. He brings such an intensity, such a power to his game on oh, another turnover. That's Josh Wheeler will not be happy with that. He should not be pushing up the sidelines. A player of his experience really should know better. There you go. There's the thieving hands of Aaron Fitz and there's the score for the captain. Fitz back on the ball, picking out Ross. GB scoring. 43-47. The game is done. Great fight from GB all the way to the very end. But sadly for them, they fall to the USA in the semi-final. And it is the Americans who will compete for the final here in Cardiff at the Quad Nations. Yeah, a little bit of a reality check there for GB. It just shows that, that when the USA wanted to turn it on, they were they were number one ranked team in the world for a reason. And, and that's what they've just shown. Hopefully it'll give something GB can now work on heading into Paris. We've got another tournament, the Canada Cup coming up, that they'll get to try a few more things, make those few final touches before the Paralympics. Great camaraderie, as always, between not just the players, but all the teams behind the players. It's a tight-knit community. These players know each other very, very well, and they'll get to know each other even better come Paris in the summer at the Paralympics. But for now, the spoils belong to the USA who have triumphed over GB in this semi-final, 47 point to 44. Yeah, I think GB can take some real positives away from that last quarter. Obviously, up until that point, USA did look the dominant team, but, but GB just showed that when they, when they made the tactical changes, when they sort of got their players' matchups right, they could really make some impacts on that USA team. Well, this is the uh, the quarter that they're going to want to reflect on and they're going to want to talk about and build upon because it was this intensity, particularly from this man, Aaron Phipps, who created not one, but two. And then they got three turnovers in a row. and Three turnovers in a row and then two towards right at the death of the game. It's a shame they didn't manage to keep quite it a little bit tighter during the match so so what we saw was those last goals at the end of the quarters really paid dividends to the USA basically those three three tries extra came from managing that clock perfectly at the end of each quarter how much food for thought is that going to be for Paul Shaw as a coach the the performance from that line in that fourth quarter oh it's definitely um May, it's going to make them rethink what, what is their strongest lines. I mean, Aaron just came on like an absolute wrecking ball, um, showed why he's so important to this team and, and really stood up today. So hopefully um, it'll, it'll mean that, that they've got a few more selection headaches. Um, it just means that they're in a stronger position than perhaps the coaches thought. Well, there was another impact from Aaron Phipps, swiping another steal. And the final try of the match when there wasn't sufficient time for, for they in white to overcome a very, very impressive USA team. And as the GB players appreciate the supporters, the spectators who've come to join us here in the Sport Wales National Centre. I think we are going to maybe get an opportunity to catch up with some of those who were on the court doing the business just moments ago. Jim has left me momentarily. He 
He's out on the court, and I think we're going to get a word with Joe Delagrave, the USA coach, who so shrewdly managed those timeouts, his team, the clock, the whole contest supremely well. And he's an old adversary as well of Jim. These two having faced off against each other in that Paralympic final in Tokyo and many, many times around the globe. This is a, a long and established rivalry between USA and GB. And while it'll hurt for GB today, not being able to reach a home final in the Quad Nations, they do have moments to build upon. And for USA, well, it just feeds that self-confidence of being number one in the world. And now Quad Nation finalists, all masterminded by Joe Delagrave, who's with Jim Roberts. Hi, so I'm joined here with Joe Delagrave, coach of USA. Joe, just give me your thoughts and reflections on, on that was amazing game. Yeah, I mean, we know GB's a really, really tough team. They're well coached, um, have athletes all over the court. And so knew that would like, our game plan come out on fire, uh, aggressive, and then and then the other part of it is just taking care of the ball, which we did uh, a fairly good job of. Yeah. And first win of the tournament for you guys, obviously it was an important one. You knew you were going to get a semi-final. Um, just say, have you been trialing things this tournament, or is that just what you're expecting? Yeah, a lot of lines that we're running. Um, we've got a lot of new guys in through the two and two five position and then some guys that came back from from being off the team last year and so really wanted to try some things then had some adversity too with some stuff uh throughout the week so happy to kind of get our full squad back and be able to come out with the win and the important bit is you're through to a final obviously the main goal of this year is paris 2024 later give us your thoughts on where you think you are going into that i mean they're like this this whole pool for paris is going to be tough um and so i think everyone here with these top top teams here it, it, all kind of jockeying to see what um the schemes are what the lineups are and so for us same thing we know paris is the goal not not necessarily winning quad nations but paris is a goal but putting us in a final against you know either france or japan is going to be a great test for us and gb gave you a little bit to think about in that last quarter um as a coach i'm sure you won't be happy with with that last quarter performance but things to work on yeah i mean we you know we were we were looking at third uh, first three quarters you got about two turnovers and our clock management was really really good and then fourth quarter obviously we got to put four quarters together if we want to win a gold in paris so um that was a bit disappointing but you know for for our guys to come out on fire and we'll put some stuff together for three quarters was great but a lot of uh room for improvement thanks joe look forward to seeing you in the final thank you appreciate it jim thanks Well, great to hear from Joe Delagrave, the USA coach, former player, and a man who, with his team, is off to the final. One final berth is Boots. There is one more semi-final to come, and that is not too far away. So don't go too far. Do come and rejoin us when France take on Japan. But for the time being, it is bye-bye for now from Cardiff.
And welcome to the Sport Wales National Centre and welcome to the Wheelchair Rugby Quad Nations 2024. It is semi-final time here in the Welsh capital and we've already enjoyed one humdinger between GB and USA. The Paralympic finalists from Tokyo went toe-to-toe -to -toe, and it was the world number ones, USA, who prevailed and booked their final berth. Who will meet them? Well, we're just about to find out as France, the European champions, take on perennial uh, competition contenders, Japan, right here on this very court. Well, that's how it all went down earlier this morning. The USA racing out into an early lead, and it was one that they didn't relinquish, although GB did rattle their cages late in the fourth quarter. But as it is, it'll be the USA who will be competing in the final that is coming later on today. But a mouth-watering second semi-final with the Japanese in red on your left going through their final manoeuvres to make sure that they are ready for the threats of France and led by Jonathan Ivana, who has been in red hot form all competition. He is very much the poster child of the sport in France. He's got a TV crew following him and they're putting his name in light as he is doing so for his side. All the good stuff goes through Jonathan Ivana. However, he's got an excellent squad around him to allow him to shine. Let's get to know them a little bit better. Well, that's GB there, our hosts, and well, France will be looking to avoid them because they'll be in the bronze medal match later. But that's in the future. In the present right now is Japan, and what a talented side Japan have. What a stylish brand of wheelchair rugby they play. And if all eyes are on France's number 21, Jonathan Ivana, the same can be said for the same number as far as Japan are concerned. Ike Yukinobu is so often the talisman for this Japanese squad. But you look across the ticket, you look at Hasegawa Yuki, Ikazaki Daisuke, players who've been around the world and done it all and bring so much attacking potency and defensive dog in everything they do. But as ever, it is an all-star cast with many to enjoy. Let's get to know Japan that little bit better.
Japan ready to go and just there skating across the bottom of your screen is one of those cameramen who is following the progress of Jonathan Ivana of France. It's quite phenomenal watching that man skateboard around with the camera and art within itself but our focus is on other talented individuals on wheels. This is wheelchair rugby, the collision sport of the Paralympics. And in the year that all roads lead to Paris, we have four of the world's very best here alongside us. Japan, they claim bronze at their home Paralympics. They're third ranked in the world. And France are on an irresistible upward trajectory right now. They're the Euro 2023 champions. They're sixth in the world. And they won two of their three matches across the preceding two days. Their only defeat coming to GB late last night here on this court. And with the flags out, the players are behind the scenes and we're ready for a little bit of razzmatazz. The referees, Elvira Zielska and Dale Thompson, and the rest of the table as well. Simon Starr, Joe Montgomery, Heather Williams, Chris Ogden and Gary Spratt make up the rest of the officiating crew. But here come the stars and here come Japan, led out by Ike Yukinobu. So distinctive with the heights that he achieves, the man from Kochi. And Ikazaki Daisuke wearing seven. Another key figure in this Japan side, born in Hakodate, a veteran of three Paralympic Games and looking to make his mark on a fourth alongside the rest of the team in red. That also includes Kurahashi Kai, the only female on the Japanese side, a 0.5 classified player from Kobe and Japan arguably putting in the display of the day yesterday as they dismantled USA 52 points to 41 will they meet them again later this afternoon in the final who knows here comes Jonathan Ivana and the French team and his second in command wearing three Cedric Nakan, another one of these star players. And there's a real sense of this French team as we say hello to Riyad Salem. But this is a French team on the rise. They were beginning to show really auspicious signs of the team that they may become out in Tokyo. But maybe that run had a ascent to form coming a little late for them to threaten in the medals, but they are very much contenders now. European champions, it is France in white, Japan in red, and time for the anthems.
Two deeply emotive and atmospheric anthems in their own unique ways. Proud moments for both sets of players and we are almost ready to get proceedings underway. And the anthem's a really key part of this Quad Nations here in Cardiff. This tournament is meticulously curated to replicate that of the Paralympics. There aren't many competitions out there in the world that put as much capital into the production, the feel, the atmosphere, and absolutely everything involved in competing in the Quad Nations from the glitzy entrance to the anthems to even the court that these players are playing upon. This is gonna be exactly the same as they're gonna encounter in Paris and including all the timings in the build up to the match. So they're really fine tuning this process so that they can have all of their players at the peak of their powers from the first blast of the whistle. I'm delighted to say that it, it's not just going to be me along the road. I've got Manny with me to, uh, to enjoy this concert. Two, two, two nations who play a really, a really attractive brand of wheelchair rugby. Yeah, it's an exciting game. Man. Two of the top teams of the world. Um, Japan are there today, but they've all strength. And obviously, France have been firing um, really well as well. So it's going to be an exciting game. Yeah, exciting game. And it's one that's underway in the blink of an eye and Japan is striking nice and early through one of those men I mentioned in the build up, Ikazaki Daisuke. And have you enjoyed the quad nations to, to this point across the last few days? Yeah, it's been amazing to have international rugby here in the UK. You know, it's an amazing experience. Um, you know, both the teams here today have been experimenting a bit. So it's good to see them both playing with their, their strike lines today. I think it's the business end of things today. Very much the business end of things. And we saw USA really turn up the temperature in their semi-final as well. It was a pretty commanding performance and one that GB fought hard in, but really it was in the USA's hands throughout. And well, when this Japanese side gets flowing, they are so hard to stop. And one of their talisman here, Ikazaki, linking up with Ike. Yeah, you see that international rugby. When a team gets to like a three, four point try lead, it's very difficult to come back. We saw that with GB this morning. You know, the confidence seems to be stripped out from the way US were playing. Um, and it's, it's very hard to come back for that. But over the last two days, man, GB have done some really amazing things. So it's, it's a lot to build on. Yeah. Do you think that they're, they're going to come away despite obviously disappointed not making the final, but overall, so pretty positive about the hit out that they've had. Yeah, definitely. I think that you know these tournaments that we build up towards, the Paralympics, are, are ultimately there to you know to experiment a little bit and to find out what which lines are firing, which of your players are up for it. You know, you learn a lot from these tournaments. So the coaches will go away from with all that information, and um, you know they'll be more confident with the lines going to the next tournament, which will be Canada Cup. Well, speaking of players to get excited about, Ikazaki has been all around the world, and well. He cruises through there. <laughs> but he's, he's like such a silky player to watch though. He just, like, he just makes it look easy. Timeless as well. Yeah. <laughs> Still going strong, no matter the age. I think he's closer to 50 than he is 40. Here is one of the emerging superstars of the game, Jonathan Ivana, who is forced into a timeout there after some good work from Kusaba. Yeah, the Japanese plush there, just, just clicking into place and putting a lot of pressure on the French team. What have you identified about the strengths of, of both these two outfits over the past few days? We'll start with France as, as they're on the ball in possession. Yeah, I think they, you know, the established teams quite set in, in, their, in their ways, but they've used a, quite a few new players um, over the last few days just to get some experience in. Um, everyone knows this line really well from Euro, so this will be the line that 
we'll see the, the floor in the Paralympics and in the big games. I think these players will probably play the, the monster minutes, really. Um, but Jonathan, obviously, he's, he's the key player there. Um, and he works really, really hard. And again, he's one of those players that... Oh, 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 oh impact! Right on cue. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great hit. Oh, he's, he's come like an asteroid from outer space there. That's what I love about this sport. When you see the big hits, the reactions you get, it's just, you know, it's so exciting to watch. I think, uh, I think from, from our perspective as well, I could see him building pace from distance and out of the blind spot rather cruelly for Ikazaki there. Yeah, I think as a player, your eyes light up when you see a player close to the to the line and you're just like you got a head full of steam and it's just like it's the perfect scenario but Ike did have the uh, the awareness to call a time out there which is a uh, testament to being a, an elite level player well, that is really one of the hallmarks of wheelchair rugby the more you watch the more you appreciate the number of plates that everybody is spinning out there it is not just the uh, the physical exertion of maneuvering yourself around the court it's the awareness of the opposition your own teammates the game clock all these components that are going on that you've got to juggle mentally yeah definitely i think when you first see the sport you know you're in awe of the, the impact and the hits and the speed and the aggression but once you start to understand the sport you realize how technical it is and it's, it's often described as chess on wheels um because it's so technical like you can see right now the the teams are keying up and they're trying to break through um, and using the clock to advantage to, to write down. There's, there's five seconds left here now. Oh, wow. wow. Even at just by the skin of his teeth, you could hear the arena getting louder and louder as the countdown came. You've only got 40 seconds of your possession to score and even at taking it down to the final three. Speaking of evergreen individuals, there's E.K. Yukinobu, who really was the figurehead of the Japanese run to the medals in Tokyo at that Olympics. Yeah, he just brings such a calmness to the team um, in, in the way he plays. He's, in, uh, he's incredibly dexterous one-handed as well, isn't he, E.K.? Very, very hard to dispossess when in possession. His ability to manipulate it around the court is so impressive. Yeah, you, you pair that with his height and speed, but he's almost a, a perfect setup in terms of his play. He's such a, an asset to the Japan team. Well, here they are, the 21s locking horns, Ivana and Ike, and Ivana just about gets the better of things, and he feeds it to Sebastian Verda, who finishes the job. It's like a hot potato, that one, right? Here he is, EK, just figuring out where he wants to move to. Quick ball to Ikazaki, one over the top. Simple as that. Let the ball do the work. Another interesting player for France is, uh, is, is Cedric. You know, he's one of those players that's, again, underappreciated when you, when you start to watch him closely, like the amount of damage he can do. Um, he's such a great player. Well, it's hard work for France to get out of their own key, but once they're free, that is electric. The dribble then from Verdun, finding even up. Yeah, the French presses seem to be not as uh, effective as the Japanese at the moment. You know, they're getting through quite easy with a couple of passes. Well, there is that one-handed take from EK that really often a hallmark of the way that he carries himself around the field the field the court field court. of field of play we can get away with that field of play <laughs> let's merge it together a bit <laughs> uh, Verdan is enjoying himself yeah. something you can't see off, off the camera is, is the other players once they see a, a bright great goal you know the defensive shape starts straight away even though they haven't scored the try um, the, the rest of the players are starting to go into defence and that's how tactical the game is you know what you do off the whistle or away from the ball is, is equally as important it's so 
such a big part of this game is not just the scoring but it's the creation of turnovers and those turnovers come as you said from that pressure that you apply to the opposition defensively and in making the inbound as difficult as can be trying to force that error from the opposition wow francis getting away one there it's a loose pass but it's been swept up by jonathan sometimes you need the rub of the green you definitely do so frustrating though you work so hard for those moments yeah. and you don't get the bounce of the ball quite and yeah. you don't get the profit from the hard endeavor now we're going back to turnovers in this game i think the the conversion rate's about 90 percent um so there's not a lot of turnovers so when you do get them you really have to capitalize um it is a sport that goes from end to end try for try well there's a goal but cruising across there born in tokyo plays for the blitz Even uh, just working those wheels furiously, getting the revolutions and slaloming his way through that Japanese defence. Yeah, he's got such a, a unique way of pushing as well. You see him almost snaking up the, the court from side to side as opposed to using both his hands together. And it's really effective because he builds up so much speed. And uh, again, it's very difficult to stop once he gets going. Looks an energy sapping technique as well. <laughs> he does like he's blown a bit, but uh, I think he always does that, to be honest. Well, he's, he's a difficult man to get off the court, and France will want as many minutes as possible from them. This would be, this would be a big statement for them to come in and claim this title if they well, if they get to the final first and foremost, and, and USA await them. Yeah, I think Paris, have, you know, being a home game, they're going to go for gold. They, they want to be in amongst medals. So I think what they're building here now is, is you know, is so important to that. Um, and that's why this lineup is going to see quite a lot of the floor. You know, these are going to be the key players uh, that are going to be contributing to that medal if they're going to get there. The prospects of the home games is something that all these Japanese players know about so well, that bronze that they claimed at the Yoyogi National Stadium yeah. in Tokyo. But for France, so much expectation. It's such a huge opportunity to put the sport on the map. And well, we're seeing it already here this weekend with this film crew who are who are following Jonathan Evenar around every step of the way. And it's not just this weekend, it's a, a documentary that they're creating. They've been doing so after the last few months and following his training, his lifestyle, and all the way up to the Paralympics. It's very, very exciting. Yeah. I think that's the beauty of the Paralympics. You know, it's, it's a chance to really showcase disability sport. Um, I remember in London 2012, it's just it, the way the sport grew after the the media and the attention it had it was phenomenal you know there's nothing we've ever seen like it and it put wheelchair rugby and disability sport and paralympics in the public eye the every average show you know it was huge um so i think it's really exciting for france but it comes with added pressure as well you know the expectation of a nation on your shoulders is, is something that is very difficult to manage and you, we saw that with us in london and obviously with japan in in uh, in tokyo so how the French deal with it and how the coaches deal with it, it's going to be really interesting. Oh, the French have let one slip from their grasp. And they may have just been bumped off court there. Just seeing a little bit of complacency in their play now. It's like twice they've kind of had a loose retained pass and, and got away with it with a timeout. And you think as the, as the game goes on and, and the pressure starts to build, you might, you might see a few of those turn into turnovers. Well, we just got a shot there of Jonathan Evenan, that distinctive snaking manner in which he generates pace and he's getting a little bit of attention to his upper arms as well and he's right back in. Almost scrabbling away and France have it in the hands. Their big number four, Rudolf Jarlam. The ball is loose and trickling away. Yeah, again, a pass just picked off, but France regained possession as it came off a Japanese player. So quite a few close shaves 
for the French so far is the Japanese are applying the pressure. And at the moment, it's Jarlan who gets locked up and then even as on the ball and everyone's free and the Japanese defence is scrambling. Jarlan, having been taken out early, now he's on the ball looking for a pass that even Ahu gets clattered. But ran just to ride the challenge. And France are across for another score. 41 seconds on the clock. It's all about time management now. That try was right on the edge as well, that 40 second shot clock. You'll see the team slow it down now because a big part of this game is, is scoring the last try. So the Japanese team will, will take their time now to try and either shave the time down to, to 15 seconds and use a timeout um, to try and ensure they score the last try. So they'll try and run this clock down. EK, very, very adept at doing that. He'll back his ability to score under time pressure, but it looks like he may need, uh, need a mechanic to come on and help him out. He's got a little bit of a technical difficulty with his chair. Yeah, he's just checking his wheels there. I think one of his wheels popped off. But it's given the French team the ability to now key up um, with all four of their players, because one of their players was picked out before, which kind of gives them a, a little bit of a small advantage. So to key up, that is the French dominating that key area. They can only have three defenders in there. And nearly everybody's in, and well, there's a way around if there isn't a way through. And that is done by Hashimoto Katsuya. So the final point of the quarter goes to Japan. They head into the break with a slender one-point lead. Cracking opening, that. It's a really entertaining quarter. Yeah, it's been really good. I think the French have, have held well, um, even though there's been a few close shaves and you think Japan about to turn the screw on them. You know, they've done really well to be it. A one point game at this stage of the game, you know, you'd be happy with that as a coach. There's a there's a there's a fluency to the way Japan play, but they're very very physical as well. They've got some real sort of beastly individuals there who knock the opposition around, but also have that presence of mind to pick their passes pretty astutely. Yeah, the way they run with the, the two high points is they they do a lot of the work. You know, the ball just sees flying across three quarters of the court, but it's the, it's the low points and the picking chairs that are creating that for them. You know. Stuff you don't see off the ball is they're creating the space and the, the ability to have that space taken out. So you just mentioned there about the picking chairs, and we can see them down there. Can we just explain those to, to newcomers to the game of wheelchair rugby? Yeah, so we have two types of chairs, basically. It's an offensive chair uh, or a picking chair. So the offensive chairs have rounded fronts that are designed to, to hit gaps and, and not be stopped, try and slide through and, and uh, be unstoppable. Whereas uh, the defensive picking chairs have these big cages at the front, which are designed to sort of get into the nooks and crannies of the other chairs to stop them moving, basically, and try and lock them up. So it is a game of, uh, of chess in terms of getting your, your low point picking chairs to take out the other points, uh, other teams' high pointers, you know, their dominant players. And if you can got to stop a dominant player with a lower pointer, you know, there's a mismatch on court somewhere. Because um, uh, you explained the, the point system, so each player is given a a point for their classification um, and in the game you're only allowed eight points on, on court at a time so each player carries a set of points uh, between three five which is like the most able player and a point five which is the most disabled in terms of functioning and impairments so you have to try and put a line up a four player within that eight point increments so you could have say three two fives I'm a 2.5 player uh, with a Jonathan Congan who's a point five um, it's pretty expensive or you look at GB's top lines, you have um, Shear Robinson's a 3.5, two twos and a 0.5. So it's always adding up to eight points or under. So for example, right now we've got Cedric Nank uh, Nankan, a 1.5 player. We've got Rudolf Jarlan wearing five. He's a 2.5 player. Jonathan Evena, a three point player. Now I'll try and do some very, very quick maths <laughs> over here to work out how much we've got left. I don't envy the coaches when they're trying to, trying to make quick changes, but we've got Jordan Ducre, 
who's there about to have the inbound on one point. So we've got a, a total of eight points there on court. What makes it more interesting is, is the participant of female players now, because they get a 0.5 reduction. Um, so if you're a 3.5 player, you, you come into a 2.5, which helps a lot in this, in this game. Yes, rather uniquely, wheelchair rugby, a mixed gender sport where men and women compete alongside each other and with each other. You see one of the best ones, Kurahashi Kai marshalling the backcourt, trying to disrupt the flow of even up. But her alongside Ikazaki are unable to tame the French talisman. Well, 13 apiece, one of our refs uh, almost gets wiped out there. Yeah, I mean, an exciting player for Japan and one of the newer players is Hashimoto. You know, he, he seems to be um, filling the spaces when the, one of the Ikes comes off, off court now. But um, yeah, he's definitely one for the future. You can see that already, the way he's playing. Yes, Hashimoto Katsuya, who plays for the Tohoku Stormers. I'll tell you what, your Japanese is better than mine. I'll give you that. <laughs> you just go hard at it. Go hard at <laughs> it with confidence. That's that's the key. Then you've got to get the tone right as well. Well, I was luck lucky enough to be out at the Paralympics uh, back in Tokyo, so picked up a few tips. And we've, got, we've also got some Japanese journalism as well alongside us. So there's a lot of international interest here in Cardiff for the whole of the tournament. French TV crews, Japanese journalists, and also USA interest. So, really, really is no, I think a, a big tournament. It's, it's one with a, like, an increasingly growing reputation as well. Yeah, I think it's, it's great for us in, in Great Britain, you know, to have this tournament. Our Quad Nation has been growing. Um, every time it's on, it's like it's getting bigger and better. You know, every team wants to now be here, and it's it's an important competition. The, the wheelchair rugby calendar, and if we can keep building on this and making it bigger and stronger, you know, it's going to be. We're going to be turning teams away. <laughs> well, at the moment, it's France trying to turn away the Kazaki. And they do so successfully, but he also has Hashimoto alongside him, who, well, he went to those Paralympic Games, age just 19 years old. And I think he's only, I think he's only still 21, turns 22 in May. So it is definitely a name for the future. And when you look at guys like E.K. Yukinobu, who's around 43 now, you can have a very, very long career, can't you, in wheelchair rugby? Yeah, I'll be honest with you, it's quite scary hearing that because like he, he looks really good already and uh, he's only going to get better with time and experience. Um, but yeah, being that young and being around these elite athletes and learning from them that he, he, he will be, you know, it's going to be uh, phenomenal for his, his progression. Still point for point in this game, yet to, to get a significant turnover or a, a break of serve, if you will. Yeah, the French backup line starting to do really well. You know, it's holding up well. Um, you think their strike line would be the only line they want to play against these Japanese players, but they seem to be holding really well. That's that's going to be really important for tournament rugby going forward, having those players that can come in and have that depth to, to change and give other players that rest. Well, there's Rodolf Jala slipping it into reverse and delivering an equalising point. And Hashimoto is well it's really showing a, a range of skills and plenty of pace and a nice little whip of the ball away into the referee's hands as well as he cruised across the line there do like a bit of flair in the act of scoring here's Jarlan picking his way through the traffic picks up some scrapes on his way and oh, is that the turnover yeah he just gets caught on the halfway line there for an over and back 
It's a really difficult position to be in when you've got that amount of pressure on you and you can't get the pass off. But that is the turnover Japan were looking for. Cedric Nankart requires a fresh wheel. So we will wait. But it's incredible, though, because Jarlan looked like he was finding a way through and the, the game can flick in a blink of an eye. One big intervention. And here we have it, Japan in possession. First opportunity to get two points ahead. And here come the heavyweights. E.K. Hashimoto remains. But Hasegawa is also one wearing two, accompanied by Ogawa wearing 23. Hashimoto has possession. No way through for Hashimoto. Japan get the point. Oh, that was a flamboyant pass there. Yeah, he doesn't make the same mistake this time. He passes off way before the halfway line. I think, just to explain, the halfway line could be a, a bit of a pressure point in the game because you have, obviously, you have to get over in 12 seconds. So you have that ticking over and you have to bounce within 10 seconds. So then you have that near it as well. And then you had a pressure of being hit over and back. It's, uh, you can see some funny things often happen on those. We've got to play it out. Well, Hashimoto scores. That even a wipes out. Ogawa Hitoshi in the process. Going to need a hand getting up. We do enjoy a big collision in wheelchair rugby, don't we? Yeah, I was going to say we were due a big hit because it's been, it's been a while since we've seen somebody on the floor, but right on cue the rear. I think that's what's so exciting about the sport and how it breaks down perceptions of disability, you know, just seeing people go at it and not having any any regrets about hitting people and going full on. It's, um, you know, it's brilliant to see. Uh, certainly Jonathan even I wasn't in a hurry to swing by and <laughs> say sorry. He was more concerned with locking up another Japanese player and he's back on the ball now. It's all fair in love and war. Yeah. I think once you understand that you know, most of the impact is taken by the chairs, you know, you don't get really get injured. Um, you can see the players are, are put right pretty quick by the staff. Um, and it's just part of the game, you know, coming out and being put back up, it's just you get used to it. Japan leading by a point. They've got a turnover. So this to stretch that lead to two. Ike in and across as he does. And on that occasion, cruising through pretty much untouched. So he's been called there for a, a meter violation. So. When the player is inbounding from a dead ball situation, um, you're not allowed within a meter of, of their space. So teams often try and either push that player in to create an advantage, or as you can see, he's accidentally on, which means he's now off for the next play. So now off for the next 60 seconds, or if or if France score. So this again is a, another piece of clock management, but also strategy because even I won't try and score immediately he'll maybe try and let his uh, the rest of his teammates manipulate their defense yeah definitely they'll, they'll try and trap him in the box you can see him going into inbound there and he's a player that doesn't normally inbound so anything you can do to upset a team there we go can you pick it up it's there brilliant brilliant work from France all coming from EK and his indiscretion Something so innocuous can have such a dramatic impact. Yeah, I think mean, the French played that perfectly. Trapped him in the line box, forced him to inbound. He forced a, a big ball over the top, and uh, it was just picked up perfectly. But the French there, just calling the timeout. What you often see is when you have a turnover, is there's often a turnover straight, straight after. And that's often because all the teams is set up in a defensive mode and all of a sudden you, you switch into offense. So everyone's out of position and it's that moment of can you get 
into offense straight away um, without using the timeout. So France with a cherished turnover and an opportunity to get back level. I oh, love that weave at pace to finish the opportunity coming in from the wheels of Sebastian Verda. Yeah, turnover's come at a great time for France and it's just going to give them a bit of momentum now. Over halfway through the second quarter, 21 apiece between Japan, the Paralympic bronze medalists and France, the reigning European champions. Feels like a very open Paralympics. Feels like a lot of teams in good form and well-matched heading into Paris. Yeah, I think the level all around the world's really improved and every team has, has, has stepped up and it's like, it's really hard to call a, a top three, let alone a top six. It's, just, it's been so, so close now. Um, any of those top six teams could be in those medal positions. Japan winning the Asia and Oceania championships and, and Germany are going to be at the Paralympics as well, having, having qualified at the expense of New Zealand in New Zealand as well in that final qualifier recently. Denmark will be there and France are going to have really high hopes but they're running out of time here near the key. But even at all desire and will the confidence to back himself even as that that clock ticks down yeah that's the, the tough part keeping that composure knowing that time's going away but not giving up on those tries Hashimoto looking to pick a path but he might just get his pocket picked wow great strength and he's free as well strong player Two minutes and 20 seconds remain, even at that distinctive left-right arm pump. Sees him skate down the left edge and link up with his teammate. 23 all. That's what you want from a semi-final. Too close to call. For France, were far the better side when these two teams met in the second match of the opening day of this Quad Nations back on Tuesday. 55-46, they were victorious, but the semi-final is a completely different beast. And even that has nowhere to go, and Hashimoto gives him an extra little tickle there after he calls the timeout. I'll tell you what, that's quite significant because they, they, I think they've got no timeouts left now. We've got one left. But yeah, they've, they've burnt out all their timeouts in the, in the first half of the game. So I think we're going to see a lot more turnovers coming now. France are on zero timeouts. And you can see in this game, teams almost celebrate timeouts. You know, when you, your opposition is forced to use a timeout, there's, there's such a, a bit of excitement from them seeing that they've got none left now. Yeah, timeouts in wheelchair rugby are used maybe slightly differently to timeouts in other sports. Sometimes they're used to, you know, to talk tactics as a way to regather oneself, but they, they're used quite strategically in wheelchair rugby to relieve yourself of pressure when the clock is escaping you. Yeah, definitely. Each team has four timeouts and um, two coaches' timeouts. So the coaches' timeouts are normally used to bring the team in and to regroup and talk, make tactical changes. Whereas the on-court timeouts can be to get you out of a sticky situations, um, but also to, to manage the clock to score those last tries. And that was a turnover there from, from Japan, pushing the player out of bounds while they were trying to score the last goal. So you called it, more turnovers to come, maybe not in the manner that, that you were thinking, but nevertheless, yeah, I think Japan might start to show their class now a little bit in 
and might see a bit of a pull away in the score. Well, it was Ikazaki who made the break, but Nakamachi, who finishes the job serenely across. That's how, quick, sorry, go on. That's how quickly the escape can turn. You know, it, we were talking about the French 11, the score at 21 apiece, and two minutes later, the, you know, the Japanese team have now taken a two point lead. Fifty seconds remaining of this opening half. As always, key to be the last the last team scoring before the break. EK calls for it back. You see, even though Japan were home and hose, they want to soak up as much of this clock as possible. Yeah, if they can score the last try here and the arrows in their favour, they'll start with the ball in the next quarter, which gives them basically a two-goal swing. And there we have a, a tactical use of that timeout, leaving just 15 seconds on the clock, which Japan will try and score with, I guess, 0.001 left, if they can. So 15 seconds left on the clock half, but now the shot clock obsolete because of that timeout. That's why the timeout is used strategically in that manner. And as you said, Japan will want to try and leave as little on the clock as possible. EK is through and he's looking to race back now and make an impact defensively. 26 plays 24. Long wow. Hail Mary. Oh my oh. goodness. That was the pass of the week, but it didn't stick. That was amazing. Had he pulled that off, that would have been absolutely devastating for the Japanese team, but just a little bit of luck you need sometimes to take that in and take it over the line. A special moment denied from us here at the Sport Wales National Centre. But half-time in a really enthralling semi-final here at the Quad Nations, and it's France trailing Japan 26 points to 24. Good game, good game. Very, very fine margins, and I know that the lead for Japan is quite centre, but they seem to have been the, a lot more controlled. They seem to be a lot less fussy. They're, they're not. They don't look to be working as hard as France. Yeah, that's the beauty of the way Japan play. They, they move the ball so quickly and so with such ease. You know, it almost looked like fluid when they were breaking the press. Whereas the French are having to work so hard every time. And, um, you know, you can see by the timeout situation, the two timeouts the, the Japanese have taken have been tactical, whereas the, the French are out of timeouts because they've been uh, in trouble. Yeah, very, uh, very tight margins and, well, we identified him at the start. That's why the cameras are rolling and following this man around with a Paris Paralympics in mind. Jonathan even uh, showing the beauty and the beast of his play with a big hit as well, which we all love. Yeah, he's, he's such a big character for France and you can see he can create so many turnovers the way he plays and the power and the speed he's got. It's just devastating to, to be playing against. This uh, this Japanese team, you know, there's a really nice way about them, and there is this blend of very very experienced players, got very talented ones as well. They're not just experienced, but they are they are awesome players. And then we've identified him a little bit. The youth of Hashimoto. There's uh, there's a real nice sort of. Uh, age profile to this Japanese side. Yeah, it's, it's really important to when you, you're building a team and obviously getting experience out there is, is so important, but to look after and to nurture your new talent coming through. And that's what Japan has seemed to do. They're doing it in the right way. 
because Hashimoto, you know, he, he's coming and he's not looking out, out of place. Um, and Japan are also missing um, Shimakawa, who also is, again, a, like a steam train when he, when he gets going. Um, so if he's added to the fold as well, the depth they've got is, is quite scary, to be honest. It's just the semi-final. The USA awaits both these sides, well, one of these sides, more like later on this afternoon as the Quad Nations 2024 comes to a climax. And this was almost going to be going viral for that pass, but the catch not made and no more points for France to take into the halftime break. It is France 24, Japan 26, second half coming at you shortly. Players going through a few handling drills before they get stuck into the second half. And you heard Manny and I celebrating the big collisions of the competition. Well, let's take a look at some of the biggest hits so far.
Well, there's the Biff, but it is also a sport of grace and elegance and skill. So let's look at some of the more finer parts of the game that we've enjoyed so far this week in Cardiff. Skills at super speed and a bit of French finesse on show here, but it is a French side who are trailing this Japanese outfit 26 to 24. We are just on the brink of getting underway for the second half. Manny, how do you see this unfolding? Yeah, it's going to be tough for France. It's a two point game with a, a Japanese ball to start. And uh, the French are really going to have to dig deep to try and stop this team because they seem to be flowing really, really well. The tries are coming with ease and um, their presses are, are starting to click as well. Japan haven't looked like making an error or surrendering a cheap turnover thus far. But as we saw in the other semi-final between GB and the USA, with the North Americans on top really from the opening minute or two. It can all change. The back end of that fourth quarter, you know, you've got to wonder if there was another quarter, could GB have come away with the result? And it can really change in a flash this game. Yeah, that's what's exciting about wheelchair rugby. It's such a high impact sport. And there's so many turnovers that can happen in the game. And it really is about momentum. Um, and then when it's in your favor, it's about capitalizing on that momentum and making sure you're scoring those tries. Well, this is an unusual collection of players here in the middle. What's going on here? Yeah, so the Japanese team are basically looking to press. They're putting a the double on on the, on the player there, and then uh, Cedric's taking out the low pointer. Um, and they're basically trying to stop the ball coming into him. But it's a lot of it, the work's done in between whistles, so they don't really stop playing, even though there's a breaking play right now. Um, I'm not sure really what's going on, but seems to be see some, something technical. I think they got a problem with the shot clocks. The, the team are now fixing and we're good to go. Got a very dedicated team from the WWR here, including our referees, everybody involved in making sure it's a smoothly run event. Good people, love the sport. Oh, and that's an error. Just lost in the rear view mirror there by Sebastian Verdat. So it's situations like that they can't be doing, you know, if they want to be winning medals, it's, they have to be scoring these tries. Such an unforgiving game, isn't it? Yeah. And that's the difference between the two teams at the moment where Japan are scoring every one of those tries, that pass will be over the top into their hands. As you can see right there, uh, the French are just have been a little bit lax with their passing. Hashimoto illustrating tremendous upper body agility to stoop low and finish that assist from Ike. Jean Lam. Jean Lam with not too much to go, but Verdun. Oh, there's another turnover has launched another turnover, it's all going south for France here. Hashimoto, he might just do it all on his own, gets outside Nanka and he nods his head as he cruises home. You can see there's a degree of panic now in France's play. Every time they get close to, to that 12 second mark, the ball is being hurled over because they have no timeouts left and that's adding pressure to the team breaking the press. Well, it's a nightmare restart, really, for France, who 
already a breakdown, as it were. And now trailing by five with just 70 seconds of this third quarter played. Yeah, and that's how quickly this change uh, game can change momentum. I still <laughs> keep thinking about that moment when they, they levelled it up at 21 apiece. And um, it's, it's a long way back now. It's a long way back. It is not insurmountable by any stretch of the imagination, even at off the court. So mixing up the line here for France. Well, mix it up, they may do, but they are running out of time. And oh, wow, what a take. What a clutch play when the pressure was pumping. And a uh, simple finish for Ducre, but it's high risk stuff for, for pretty meagre gains at the moment. And well, for Japan, it's easy street all the way home. Yeah. And that's the hard part, they're, they're scoring the try so quickly and easily that the French are having to, to battle to get out. You are going to see some amazing passing going on as this game goes on because they're going to have to get out of uh, some sticky situations. Great push in there, though. Charlan gets sparks flying. Well, that's a very, very good pass, Nanka. A match to it and scoring. Hashimoto. Again, he got a call there for, like, for the ball over the top, but he had the composure to just have a look and thought, you know, it's not as risky as I want it to be, and uh, he decided to push out with it instead. Is there an argument when you get to this distance ahead of five points that you do just try and take 40 seconds to score each time? I, mean, I, know, that's, I know that's probably anti in the spirit of the game, but just wondering if... You know, if that's a tactic the teams ever employ, even though even this far out from the conclusion. No, I, I think in this environment here at the Quad Nations, man, all the teams are trying to develop and to utilise this time on court. So you might see it in a bigger game where you know if your goal's up, um, and it maybe in a final you want to win, you want to limit those chances. Um, but oh, there's a turnover. That's what France needed, just a, a single turnover to to change the momentum and give them that try to claw one back. Well, they, yeah, there you go, Jarlan. In and winning that turnover. And feeding Verdat. Hashimoto goes bumper carring through. And France, have caught, uh, Japan have caught an equipment there just as they basically just saved them using the timeout or, or being called for 12 seconds. But you can see the French spirits are up. After that turnover, there's a bit of belief and a bit of confidence flowing back in. And often that's all it can take, just a single turnover to, for that belief to come back in. And you have that extra push and that extra, that extra hit, and it can lead to another turnover. Japan. Get the ball back in play, Hashimoto. Wheelies around the corner, straightens up. Really starting to enjoy himself. And say, uh, there's a bit of swagger to him. I like that though. You've got to have a bit of character on court, right? Especially if you're carrying those amount of points. I think France are in trouble here again. Kazawa is the one berating himself for a loose arm in there. Yeah. Over exuberance to dislodge the ball when maybe he didn't need to make that challenge. Yeah, he's, I think he's pleading his innocence there because his coach won't be happy with that. They had all the poor players in that small quadrant, you know, with about nine seconds gone. A turnover was looming and uh, he put his hand in the sweet jar and uh, got called for it. No matter how old you get, the uh, cookie jar remains irresistible. Very much so. I think as a player, there's nothing more satisfying than, than getting a steal off of the player. You know, it's something I used to, to love doing, but when it doesn't come off, your coach has got some ammunition to fire, I tell you. Now, 
Jolan finds a clear route through Japan's red wall. 32-29, even up, back onto the court. Japan have mixed it up as well with Kurohashi on wearing three. So the Japanese team taking a, a coach's time up there, very tactical move, because uh, Ike was in the box and he was forced to inbound. So rather than making him inbound, they're using a coach's timeout to reset, maybe have a chat, but give the opportunity for another player to inbound now. Well, the last time he had an inbound, it proved to be the turnover that France leveled things up at 21 all. That seems like a distant memory for a French team who've been under the pump for much of this third quarter. There's still plenty to play, though. Four and a half minutes to go. Just three points, the deficit. It's going to be four. Or will it? Oh, wow, that's commitment from Ivana. But he gets boshed over. The crowd purr with delight. And he's going to need a hand up, is the French star. Beautiful ball from Ikazaki and even out coming across at pace. So difficult to maintain balance. Yeah, the, the Japanese player just got a little touch on him and it was enough at that pace to take him out sideways. Uh, even out is the one leaving an opposition man in a spin on this occasion. Leaves Nakamachi in his vapours. You can see the French energy just change when he's on the court. So him is such a big player for the French team. The pace of their game just goes up. Oh, that looked like a spinning foul to me, but it's um, the referee's call. So just to see, clarify for, for the viewers as to what a spinning foul is, because, you know, we've we've been lauding some of the big impacts and, and watching even our go over there, but there is a subtle difference. Yeah, so it, it interests the safety that you'll see that the, the chairs in the centre of the wheel uh, is what we call the axle. So you're not allowed to hit anywhere behind the axle because of the speed and the pace it go, the, the players go at. Hitting you on the axle could cause a really imbalance um, and players can come out quite violently. So it's, it's one of the rules that's kind of really enforced um, to stop, stop people coming out in that dangerous way and to keep the, the sport safe. I must say, it's very rare you see a spinning foul these days, man, um, because the players obviously respect the rules yeah. and the, the turnovers can be so big. Yeah, certainly our, our celebration of the collisions isn't, um, isn't a condoning or encouragement to be uh, committing dangerous play. It's, uh, it's physicality within the boundaries of safety and the law of the game. It's like any sport, there's, there's rules in place to keep the, everyone safe. But um, I'm all for full, full contact and, uh, and impact. Kazaki. Oh, this could be it. Oh. There we go. Big play coming up. Cedric celebrating that timeout. Did all the work there to take out Ike, and it's been another timeout gone for Japan. We could be in for a fascinating fourth quarter, couldn't we? Yeah, they've got one left, and it's, it's a three-point game at the moment with the Japanese ball, so it's all to play for. So so if, well, if both sides go down to having no timeouts left, it's going to be very open. There's going to be a lot of opportunities out there for turnovers. Yeah, I think that's the balance for the teams as well. When, you know, when you're using timeouts for for technical situations to create advantage, you might need them later on in the game. And it's like, should we have saved them a little bit? But it's a close call. I think the Japanese will probably feel confident with this, the lead that they've got now, that they can maintain it, but the French are gonna put them under a lot of pressure 
for the rest of this quarter and the second part of this half. Igazaki gets another point for the Japanese. Just under three minutes remaining here in the third quarter. Japan at the moment in command of this semi. Potentially booking a date or a time more aptly as it's this afternoon with the USA. He defeated GB in the opening match of the day this morning. Ivana goes down the wing. And a bit of a bit of a raw, bit of energy from the French support staff and uh, EK. That big sticky pour up in Here the sky. Long ball Ooh. to Ikazaki, and it's another try for Japan. Jonathan just got a nick on the uh, on uh, Ikazaki's chair there, and he thought he might have done enough to create a turnover. But Ikazaki showing his speed and his pace just to gather for the try line. When you consider how few and far between turnovers are in the game and you look at the range of passing particularly ones like that accuracy and the weight is phenomenal yeah it's, it's, it's great to see how these athletes move that ball around you know um, in terms of their impairments you know it, it, it's it's beautiful to see like the, the range of passing and the skill they have and that comes for hours and hours of practice um, to be the best they can at their craft it's also it's also a consideration of who you're passing to as well, their mobility, their speed, their ability to gather the style of pass that you you throw to them as well. Yeah, very much so, because it can vary from player to player. You know, if you're passing to one of your, your low pointers, you know, you have to put a bit, of, a bit of a bounce in, make it more easier to catch, whereas the higher pointers, you can put a bit more venom in and throw it into them. But um, that's the beauty of this sport. It incorporates so many different disabilities playing together. Um, you know, for the common goal to win. Oh, even that, getting every Japanese player into a spin. And managing the clock, gets shunted from behind by an impatient EK. And we're into the clock management period now. 1.44 on the board. Three points the difference. EK pops the periscope up. Claims it high, releases his attackers, and Ikazaki is in for another. Constant analysis going on there. A little shot of the coaching staff just reviewing some of the plays. All that on the go analysis, looking to improve the team's output minute by minute within the match. Jalan trying to put the moves on. Wow, big shot coming in from Ikazaki. Yeah, Even that. Jalan's played really well. He, you know, he's been a, a great secondary ball under. Um, in a lot of his, they, they've held really well, giving them other players a break. But he's been really impressive this tournament, to be honest. Speaking of well-weighted balls, that's pretty bang on the money right there for Japan and Nakamaki. So this is uh, it's not going to be good for the French team right now and uh, the French coach is not going to be happy. As we talk about time management and scoring the last try, Jonathan has decided to reach in. He's been called for a, a reaching foul which means he will spend the next minute when there's only 57 seconds left, but he'll be in the bin, which allows Japan to play four on three for the remaining minute of this game. Very surprised to see them score that try though. I thought they would have run the clock down a bit more. Well. They don't run the clock down. Oh, if they got the turnover, Kazaki runs out of court. And maybe they just wanted uh, even now to take the inbound. Yeah, I mean, I think they'll have a game plan in, in mind. 
because um, every team manages the clock differently. Now they're in set plays going out. But a French will be happy with this. Leaves 35 seconds in this third quarter and a Japanese ball. Japan leading 39-36, looking to score the final try of this third quarter. Ikazaki in possession, in command. Ike's all locked up in the backcourt. So Japan have the numerical advantage. Nakan comes thundering in. The Ikazaki. Ike on the wraparound. Six seconds left. He'll take as long as he can to make the try here is a 1.2 seconds on the clock. Failing a mercurial pass from deep. That'll be that for the third quarter and Japan end it, leading by four. France 36, Japan 40. One quarter between Japan and a final at the Quad Nations. Cedric Nanka getting the fluids on board and getting mopped up. It is hot and sweaty work out there on court. Man, he's such a, a great player to watch, man. He's like a bustling ram. You know, the power and, and, and pace he comes out in that. And he's so hard to move. Well, we saw right there at the end, but well, we heard it before we saw it. In fact, he took a full court wind up to smash into Ikazaki who has uh, really been pretty supreme in this quarter. Plenty of tries. And I have to say that each and every player who's taken to the court in red has stood up and they, they've proposed a valuable contribution. Yeah, I think the Japanese coach would be really, really happy with what he's seen so far. You know, going against European champions and, and playing the way they are. You, you know, no one's looked out of place. Everyone's taken the court. They're taking their chances. Um, even the newer guys, you know, they haven't looked out of place, which is really encouraging for them. And at this stage of the build-up, you know, towards the Paralympics, you want every player to be firing. You want that, that hunger with them to, uh, to succeed. And you can see with the Jap Japanese team that they're there. One caller left and the arena just beginning to fill up with a few more people after a very early start that saw the hosts GB sadly dumped out of the gold medal reckoning they came up against the inspired USA side well better than that a Chuck Aoki inspired side who put their place in the final 47-44 and at this very moment it looks like Japan will be the ones greeting them in that final that is coming up later today at 4.30. We'll have a bronze medal match between GB and the loser of this encounter before that. Yeah, it could be a rematch of the, uh, the European Championships final. Um, and I think that'll have a bit, a bit of added bite to it because the, uh, neither team will want to finish bottom of this, this tournament. But uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to watch. Well, you say neither team will want to finish bottom of this tournament, and absolutely, but it wouldn't be inconceivable to say that these four could be the Paralympic semi-finalists. They could be the top four of the Paralympics. So that's the sort of richness of the quality of the competition that we have on our hands here in Cardiff. Yeah, I think over the last four or five years you've seen how quickly the, develop, the sports developed around the world um, and every team now is, is in contention I'd say you know at least top six in the world could be vying for those four places to get into those semi-finals um, so when uh, when Paris comes around you're going to have to have your A game and there's not going to be a, a chance to have an off day even that 
he'll be that. He will be leading the charge of Les Bleus. He's looking for an avenue to the try line. Well, there is none. It's just a red dead end at the moment. EK chasing hard to get around the edge and he almost intercepts even up. I mean, that's him that signature move to, to find the tightest of gaps with the smallest of margin, margins to score those tries. He's got a real knack for it and he does really, really well to get his team out of pressure. The ability to appraise whether a space is indeed large enough to blast through is absolutely remarkable, isn't it? Yeah, it's a combination of, of eyeing up the space, making sure you can fit, but then also forcing your way through. And getting there on time. Yeah. <laughs> and that's like, you know, why these players have rounded chairs. So when they do come into these tight gaps is, you know, to, to hit and to push players away and, and have that pace to go through. Hashimoto on the ball. Shot clock timing down. You can't see it at the moment, but even at who is in the penalty box is shut out by two Japanese defenders. He says, I'll go take the inbound. So that's even up out of the game as far as the inbound is concerned. And then those two defenders working hard to lock up Mathieu Tillier. But try as you might, you can't keep the Frenchman out of the game. Even ah leans into the challenge of Hashimoto, who goes oh, no. careering oh, no. over at dangerous pace. So off the ball there, um, you see a spinning foul being called, which results in the, the team who's carrying the ball losing it to a turnover. And that is it's heartbreaking to watch because it was it looked like it was purely accidental. But the rules are the rules and that results in a turnover. I mean there's like there's a lot of biff out there, a lot of menace as well. Chairs colliding into one of another. And EK, that distinctive reception technique, one-handed. And all four players locked up over there. And two pairs dueling up top. Hashimoto with that strength. One-on-one on one with Verdun. The French are already Still they hard. battle. The shot clock ticking down, but Hashimoto Slips it into reverse, and it's more points for Japan. I think we might get a, a replay of this collision that saw Hashimoto. Yeah, you go can see that. Wildly. That hit was just behind the axle, and his momentum took him over, resulting in this spinning foul. Even that. Can't keep him quiet, can you? No, it's going to be a big six minutes now for, for France. They really need turnovers. Well, we saw in the GB USA semi-final multiple turnovers in the fourth quarter. Almost enough to rather remarkably get GB back into the match. So it's not inconceivable that France could rattle a few chairs here and come up with the big plays to get them back into the contest. Now, the French team have got a lot of spirit. They've got a lot of players that could really perform. And um, if they're going to do anything now, they've got their starting lineup. With their, with their big layers on, so it's going to be the chance to do it. Got to say with Japan, though, the ability to take off Ikazaki Daisuke and bring on Hashimoto, what an interchange they've got there. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's allowing players to rest and to have breathers. You know, the game's so intense and so much energy in that. Even at trying to force his way through by pure will, but Hashimoto on hand to deny him, but Unbelievable vision there. A great pass off for the tribes under a lot of pressure there. Third out arriving right on cue. And that's what you want from your players when you're in those sticky situations to be there, to be that person who's going to score the try, who's going to be taking the pressure off you. Well, that was, we were right up close there. For, for once, 
even out, unable to squeeze, squeeze himself through a goal, a not, gap. Not for a one to try in though, he was really trying to force the issue there. But when you're up against a three or a 3.5 bar with equal amounts of energy and power, it's very difficult to break through those gaps. Well, this is a little more simple. The, uh, the deficit reduced back to four. Those turnovers still required, demanded by France. The French team doing really well here on the press. Can they hold them out? Hashimoto, it's like a bull, isn't he? So strong. Just bullies his way through the challenges and just having that strength of being able to battle your way out of those tight spots. Yeah, I mean, it, there's a lot of pressure with that time. Was, that was almost on 11 seconds, so the French are doing really well to try and stop them, but they have that extra energy just to get over the line sometimes. Even that. What a pass, traveling in one direction, feeding it the other way on the reception back. Beautifully worked team score by the French. Rounded off by their talisman. We have a coach's timeout by the French team. Could be interested to see what the French coaches are saying right now with four minutes to play. It's a four point game. What can they get out of their players in these final four minutes? What can they say? What can they do to change the momentum of this game? It only takes one big moment, doesn't it? Yeah. Like one big turnover and also, as well as the impact on the scoreboard, it's, it's the impact on the, the mentality and the psychology of the Japanese players because it has been reasonably comfortable for them so far. You know, were their results to be tested very, very late here, it might, might mix things up, might rattle a few cages. Yeah, I think that's what the French are hoping now, is to, to really sort of upset and create some momentum with the turnover. But um, the Japanese are, are very, very experienced and um, they love game management. To see this out, I, I, I think. Well, Nanka is off the court and the other bulldozer on the field is Hashimoto, who is travelling at speed towards the try line, arcs back on himself, links up with Ikazaki. 47 plays 42, three and a half minutes left of this fourth quarter of the semi-final. The USA await the victor. Nice link up play. Verda in for another score. Norimatsu onto the ball. The French are working so hard to get this press to click, but the Japanese are scoring with such ease. But Hashimoto. He's got the potential to be a real star in Paris, hasn't he? Yeah, definitely so. I think, you know, the way he's grown as a player, um, he's just exciting to watch. And, and with his age and, and his ability, he's definitely one that's going to be dominating the, the world stage in the future. Well, Verda gets himself across the line, but, you know, all of this sort of celebrating of the try scorers can't underplay the significance of the the lower point players who are doing all that, that hard work in the the dark behind the scenes the the less glamorous stuff that creates the light for these scorers to shine yeah i think when you start to watch the sport you really start to appreciate how much of a team game this is and uh, how much these these low point defending players do to to create space and then openings for, for these guys that score the tries to, to have that flair and to look good. You know, they do all the dirty work away from the court, man. So it's, um, it's, it's a very much a team game. They get all the plaudits in the changing rooms from their teammates. That, that, that's, what, that's what really counts. Even that cruises across for another. Still four points, the deficit, the clock very much in favour of the Japanese. What pressure can Nankat apply? 
as he comes thundering in. Oh, almost. Ikazaki has his pocket picked. And there's a timeout called just in the nick of time. And we talked about saving those timeouts for crucial moments there. The Japanese team were able to, to have that last timeout to, to stop the turnover. Well, they're all out now. Yeah. So, two minutes, 23 to go. No timeouts for either team. No get out of jail cards. EK. He's such a good player to have in your armory. That height that he offers, that passing range that goes awry and even uh, scoops up the loose ball and swiftly takes it to the line. I've got to say it, the curse of the commentator. <laughs> As you're speaking about his handling, he just gives away a pass and gives the French a little bit of hope. My apologies to EK and Japan, but more pressure and another. Oh, Nankan's revved up. And this is what we love to see. An uncharacteristic error there by Ikazaki. Just turned a little bit too quick and the ball rolled off his lap. But the French are celebrating this turnover, knowing they've got a bit of momentum going into the last two minutes of this game. Wow. All of a sudden, those, uh, those time marks are gone and the pressure's back on the Japanese team. Well, you always talk about the possibility of a comeback. As, as a neutral, you hope, but you don't always believe. Well, here for France now, this is their big moment. They've been down and out for much of this match, but even our is snaking his way to the try line and for the first time in a long long time france are back within two of japan ek being harassed by nanka and even a long ball loose ball intercept france back on the ball again this semi-final ain't done you could not script this And the French team have put it together. The Japanese team will want that clock to disappear, that 1 minute 25 that's remaining. And the, the French team will want another quarter if they can get it because they have momentum now and they're causing turnovers, uncharacteristic turnovers. Well, they might just get it. We haven't been to extra time today yet. So strap yourselves in. And even up, inspire the last part of this comeback. He slaloms through the red defenders. He's in the groove, he's in the mood. And France are to within one point. Never saw this come in, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Decibels on the rise here in the Sport Wales National Centre. Hashimoto, ball on the lap, all that power and pace outstrips the French defence and Nankan is going to hurry him across the line. 53.2 seconds remaining, two point game. The French Jap really have to try and score quickly now to try and force the issue. No timeouts left either side, even now. Looking for his opening. Drops the shoulders, pumps the left and right arms. He's seen a hole. He's got the pace. He's always got the ability to squeeze through the last gap. 49, place 50. 30 seconds and a bit of change on the clock here. Flipped out the back door to Hashimoto. The French need to defend for their lives here. Hashimoto. Takes on even our outstrips him. Verdans, the last man to be beat. And Hashimoto will do all he can to wind down this clock. And that may just be the game. Two points the difference, 8.3 seconds on the clock. 
That's been an amazing massive effort from the French team. Never really saw that coming, but the effort, they got put into the turnovers. And we might see a single. Oh. Oh. Referee's uh, not called that one, unfortunately. It's just as a fallen player. Two players coming together. No late drama. No late drama for us here. In what was almost a thrilling comeback here for the French. No, it's been such an exciting semi-final to watch. You know, it's, it's almost almost the, the comeback of all comebacks for the French team. But the Japanese, it looks like they've done enough just to see this through. Hashimoto, who scored so many tries, finishes with the ball in his grass. And Cedric Nanka is still having a bit of fun as he tries to grapple it free. And the crowd here at the Small Wales National Centre show real appreciation for a hugely entertaining and high calibre semi-final between two nations that have got the potential to go very deep at the Paralympics in Paris. Almost a comeback to savour for the French, but instead it is a journey to the final of the Quad Nations here for Japan. Final score, France 49, Japan 51. Manny, what a, what a great game. What, what an enjoyable little romp through four quarters of wheelchair rugby that was. Yeah, it goes to show how, how close everything is at the moment with these teams fighting for these places. You know, it was, it was such an end-to-end an -end game to start. And like with tries being scored, scored by both teams, it was really difficult to call. A little bit of composure from the Japanese team to pull away, but you could see the French never gave up towards the end. Had a lot of energy coming in, started to force turnovers, but it just wasn't enough. Well, here's the fourth quarter, and this is where it really came alive in the match. Japan remaining in control for much of it, but it was right to the wire. Even Ah kept on pressing, kept on squeezing. There was a mighty old collision, some more legal than the others. As the turnovers built late in the game, Ivana and Verdan began to purr. This is a beautiful ball and a wonderfully team work score. Hashimoto almost, almost getting in the way of that one. But this is where, this is where the, the energy began to really turn. It was that loose ball from Ike. Yeah, the, the, the French team really forced the Japanese players into, un, well, uncharacteristic areas. There's two in a row, to be honest. Um, it's not something you often see with the Jap Japan players. Um, being under that pressure with that time going and, and the uh, score getting closer and closer, it was, um, it was interesting to watch. Very, very good. And it certainly whets the appetite for the medal matches which are to follow this afternoon. We've brought you three matches a day thus far in the Wheelchair Rugby Quad Nations in Cardiff. But for the third and final, it is going to be four. It is going to be a bronze medal match and a gold medal match to follow. After the lunch break, Japan will meet the USA in the gold medal match while it will be an all-European affair for bronze between GB and France. Join us then.